All right. Hey, Graham and Nick, um, how do you scan your film? Uh, I've got a couple of different processes. Um, I do. Uh, I Well, first of all, I have a V700, so I can scan up to theoretically 8x10. Um, I have, so I do a lot of flatbed scanning, and if I really want a good high quality image, that's what I go to. This week, I actually received my pixelator, and I have done one little um, test on it using a 4x5 negative. Uh, I have not played around with the gates yet. I actually got it on Tuesday, and since school is back in session and I'm in front of students on Tuesdays and Thursdays uh, for like eight hours straight. Hey, Graham, um, what gates did you get with the Pixelator? I, um, I, that's the thing is I haven't played with them yet. Theoretically, the gates should do, as I understand it, the gates should do medium format from 645 to 6 by 12. Uh, it does 35 millimeter. It does 110. Um, and I believe me, I have not taken it out and played with it. I've just looked at it and, and you know, moved some gates around. I know Simon Forster um, is making a slide adapter where you just drop in a mounted slide. Uh, that was not one of the original ones. So he's doing that. Um, I, one of the things that I was going to do when I first... Uh, heard about the thing and I was starting on the Kraken was I was going to do a six by 12 gate, but I think it does that naturally and natively. So I don't even have to do a six by 12 gate. I think it essentially will do anything from 110 up to four by five. Now, I don't know about sprockets. I don't so, know. A lot of I, I talked to Hamish um, maybe two days ago. And we had put out like a website that's open source designs for drop-in gates. He was trying to convince me to do either like a 16 millimeter or uh, like an APS uh, gate, which I think I would like to do just as a nice thing for the community. Uh, but I think it's really clever because a lot of people are going to start making gates for all sorts of film that you can't find a negative carrier for. I think that was right. a really good move on Hamish's part. All of those people that bought 70 millimeter um, film for like 616 or what, isn't that, isn't 616 70 millimeter film? Something along those lines. Uh, there, somebody has to make gates for them. I don't, I don't have one, but um, that I think is, uh, I, I think that there are lots of really cool things that are possible with that. Now, there are problems with that type of scanning process, and that is you have to have a digital camera. Um, you have to have a lens that will focus at the right distance from the film, which is something that I've been struggling with. Um, I was talking about the fact that um, those of you who are watching on YouTube, uh, you're looking at me through a Practica Pentacon um, 28 millimeter 2.8 that uh, came on my Zenit, which is, you know, it's not the best lens in the world. It's probably one of the cheaper lens, lenses in the world. But I'm using that on my Fuji with a, um, what I got was a Fuji adapter um, that is uh, just Fuji FX to M42 without any registration distance. It just comes in right at the base. And then I screw a uh, an M42 helical on that. So then I can move it in and out. And then I also have the focusing helical that's on the lens. And I don't know whether that's going to really mess with the quality. Uh, but it does allow me a wide range of distances and zooms, uh, essentially. Yeah, that seems like not the most practical lens. For no, it's a, it's a Practica. It yeah. says Practica right on the lens. We'll get into that, <laughs> that later. So so when, when you're done, I'm going to tell you the kind of uh, camera lens I use for that purpose. And I might have an extra one if you want to try that. Oh, okay. Sure, sure. Um, uh, and you know, I was just looking around, uh, for a 28 millimeter lens. And then I realized I had one, 
Um, and I want to use my Fuji because of the resolution. My mm -hmm. other option is a Rebel T1i, which is what I'm using for my webcam right now. And it is, um, uh, I don't think that the EOS system is really tailor-made for, um, for digitizing images on a light table. Um, now, I will say that the one big problem, and, I, and I've been playing around with this. I've, I've had a light table for about a year or a year and a half ever since Hamish came out with this, um, with this Kickstarter. Um, and I have been the entire time working to eliminate the reflection of the lens on the film. Uh, because what happens is you have light coming up from the light table, it hits the lens, it gets reflected back onto the film, and then you see it on the film. Um, and so I've been working to eliminate that. And I think I finally have enough masks. Like I have a, uh, in, uh, I have a piece of mat board that goes over the, um, the light table, the part of the light table that's not being used. Mm -hmm. And I, um, yeah, I do. I have an opening that I, I originally had an opening for four by five. That was what its original idea was. It was four by five, but I dropped that on top of the pixelator. And it's almost exactly the right size. I wonder uh, if a polarizer would be helpful at eliminating that reflection. Well, the reflection is physically in. I mean, if it would reflect the polarizer. Um, well, the, the deal is, the light would hit the polarizer, bounce off. Uh -huh hit the film, bounce off, and then go back into the lens, but often reflections turn out oh, to be polarized okay. light. I'm not yeah. sure about the mathematics it, of this. Um, well, it's, it's, like, it's like you can use it. Well, that's why fishermen wear polarized sunglasses, so they can see uh -huh. the fish behind the reflection. You know, Right. Right, exactly. I think there are simpler ways, but when we used to photograph art to reproduce it in the studio on 4x5, generally we used polarized light sources. Uh -huh. uh, and then we use a polarizer over the lens, and so we could pick up a nice uh, reproduction of a painting, like an oil painting that had sort of like stippling and texture. Right, that right. Reflect in weird. Well, shiny, the shiny varnish is the problem. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. It was, it was the shiny varnish plus like the three dimensionality, right. which it was very hard. Uh, mm -hmm. You get millions of microscopic highlights that just blow out everything. Yeah, yeah. It's like <laughs> yeah. hot. It's like the hot pixels, basically. Yeah. So we had two giant polarizers that went over each light, and then mm -hmm. we had one on the lens. Oh, and, I see. Over the light. You know what, what? So what Graham's describing, I think I have seen in the form of almost like an orange flare effect, where I'm not actually seeing the lens per se, but there is some kind of angular extra light coming in. Um, and what I've been doing to, when I digitize film with a camera and a macro lens, what I've been doing mostly is just working at, at night and turning off almost all the lights in the room. And then I do use a blackout card that, co that covers the extra light table yeah. surface. And if I do all those things, I, I'm usually fine. Um, some I, people go to the length of creating a whole like black tube that goes all the way up to the mm -hmm. lens. And, you know, it's basically like essentially bellows for the setup. Um, oh, that's an idea. I hadn't, I hadn't thought of that. Um, yeah, and, I and will, that 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 will help. But you still, what you're talking about, you still could get some reflection. But I think if, if you get rid of the outside reflection and flare and extra stuff, that's like ninety some percent of it. Yeah. Yeah, um, I uh, am doing it in my dark room, and what I have for my um, light or for my camera stand is I just use. Um, I, the stand from, uh, the Miapta, um, enlarger that I got from Nick. So, yep. so that's the mount that goes up and I can, you know, so I can put it up, uh, you know, a meter away from the, from the film base, um, yep. or pretty close, I'm sure. And then I can take it down to almost kissing. Yeah. The, so you, uh, so you need a macro lens. It's pretty straightforward. You, you don't have any kind of macro. I also, do not have a macro lens. lens. Well, really? What are, uh, what, well, what we'll go have. another time. We'll go over what adapters you have, but I probably yeah. have a macro that you could use. So, yeah. So. And I was looking at that. Um, uh, part of the deal. Uh, I mean, I was looking at uh, an M42 macro, um, but I, you know, uh, because I figured those would be the cheapest ones that are out there, right? Because M42 lenses are generally mm -hmm. the cheapest. 
look for female. look for Vivitar Comine uh, made. So I, I have a rec that I was going to get to later, but it's the yeah. Nikon 55 millimeter 3.5 micro Nikkor. Uh, yeah. There was a time where I was picking them up for five and fifteen dollars. Mm -hmm. They're tack sharp and rectilinear, and um, I would use it for like all of my eBay listings and just um, photograph. I still use it for everything on CameraDactyl.com. Basically, it's been shot through one of those lenses. I use, yeah. Like, I use the Nikkor 55 3.5. I, I, Graham, I think I have one that I'm supposed to be selling for right. some guy. So, um, and I also have the 2.8. Yeah, I also have the 2.8, which I use as well. And the only advantage of that one is it's a little easier to focus, but it's minor difference with yeah. the digital camera. And and I, there is one other thing we should re remember to go over. But if you're using a Fuji to digitize color film, uh -huh. there, if you go for the highest resolution and you start stitching and all that, you can get into color artifact issues. And there's a simple way to stitch. Mm -hmm. to, to fix them, but you have to know the sequence. You can use something in Lightroom called Enhanced Details, oh, um, but you have to do it on the raw files. Enhanced Details, just like in CSI? You know, they're, they're starting to write really good algorithms <laughs> to actually do that. Yeah, and, and this uh, is an yeah. automatic thing, but you have to do it to the raw file. You can't do it hey, later in the process. Hey, just yeah. think, in Star Trek The Next Generation, um, but you know, so we're talking, what was that? Uh, 1995, they came out with these, these iPads and the, I, and they would have people sign things on the iPad. So that is science fiction coming real, just like, um, the in, in, enlarge enhance. What's the license plate number? Okay. When, when do their tabs expire? Well, so the thing is that enhanced details is a misleading title. It's it's not enhancing the detail. It's fixing the artifacts that happen when different no, companies different companies software goes to war with each uh, other. I just went. Uh, I just <laughs> went and had had fun. Okay, so the um, the fifty five three point five uh, micro Nikkor uh, appears to be eighty dollars. Um, okay, and another really good choice is a Minolta fifty millimeter. F three point five, that's a oh, great okay. one. The, the and I use that as well as like so. Um, at least the Nikon has a very small element inside of a big black cone. And it's oh a yeah, yeah. Length. So as you pull your uh, camera away from the film, there's uh, one less of a large surface to reflect, and that light is also dimmer. Uh, uh -huh. Yeah, it, it's a text. It's a textured cone too. Also, you know, you get a more rectilinear and faithful reproduction of, of the film as your lens gets longer. Yep. Yeah. Sometimes for this work, I might use like even a 90 millimeter uh, yeah. lens. Another high recommendation then is, an, is a Vivitar 90 millimeter uh, full macro made by Comine. And it has an incredibly long focus throw, which is actually really okay. nice when you're focusing on a piece of film. It's right. very, very easy to focus right. people. And they go for cheap because people don't want to use them in the field because you've got to like rotate the not the focus ring a couple of times to get but right. it's full. It's also one to one. So you could shoot tiny pieces of yeah. film with this thing without bothering with extension tubes. So the Minolta it's a, it's a nice lens too. Yeah, the Minolta uh fifty three point five macro is uh in the sixty to ninety dollar range. Mm -hmm. And it's Vivitar. What was it? No, 120? 90 oh. millimeter uh, F2.8 full macro. It's a one to one. Yeah, I think that was kind of in the same set in years as they made it like a Tokina 92.8. Uh, yeah. Macro, yeah. yeah. This, the one I have was made by Comine, and I think it's a fantastic lens. I, I use it a lot just for straight photography. It's yeah. not all macros work at a distance. This one's really nice at all ranges. Yeah. And I could go on. I really, I have a thing for macro lenses and I've got a bunch of them and most of them work really well. So, so it is, it's more like find a cheap one. <laughs> you so know? before we yeah, get into under bucks, eBay people. land and, and Graham buying uh, and building new setups, um, Nick, are, are you a uh, digital camera scanner or do you have a yeah. flatbed or a traditional film scanner? How do yeah. You so, so I use a traditional thir uh, film scanner for 135 format because it was reasonably affordable and 35 millimeter film is really a pain in the ass to shoot with a digital camera. It's so small. Um, and I like to keep it, things fairly simple. So I found that thing and it works really well. It's slow. What is it? Gives, 
It's a Prime Film XE, which is an American badge uh, German, uh, and they, they sell them as Reflecta in Europe. Uh, it's the same thing, but in America, they're called Prime Film XE. And the 35 millimeter one, I think it works great. I've heard that they're very expensive. 120 one is not as good. It's had uh, mechanical issues or something. Um, but anyway, the, the scanner works really well, and it can out, it can output several different, uh, depending on the scanning software, you can output different kinds of files. So depending on what you're going to do with them, it's versatile. It's consistent. Um, you just put the film in there, and you get a consistent result every time, and that's nice. On um, the other hand, I, d I never felt like spending the money for a big flatbed to do 120 film. The things like the V700 are really appealing, but I always end up looking at the price and backing away. So what I started doing is shooting all my larger negatives with my Fuji and macro lens. And I found an old copy stand, and that's a big part of what makes it practical. If you have a permanent setup that keeps the camera perfectly square to the light pad, then you can just go and throw some film in there and take some fast shots and know they're going to be useful. Um, if you have to set up a tripod and all that every time, it's very discouraging. Absolutely. So I, I, rec I recommend some kind of coffee stand setup. And the, um, the, then you get into this whole song and dance of what are you going to do with the, with the raw file and to make it into a good looking. Uh, so I shoot mostly color print film, and that's the, sort of the most challenging to deal with um, because mm -hmm. you've got to invert it and get rid of the color mask and then come out with something that's got enough uh, juice in it that you can work it in software to, to finish the job. So I'm pretty happy with it. It's always kind of an adventure. I'm never quite sure what I'm going to get, but it's teaching me a lot. And I the best results I get out of my digital camera are the best photographs I produce. So it seems to me worth the extra work. Um, sure. There, I think that the, the choice of sensor is a big part of it. Um, I use Fujis because I love to shoot them. They do sometimes prevent me with some, present me with some color issues. I've found ways to solve them. This is really kind of a personal thing when, when you get into it, the software. That's, that's where all the snarls sure. maybe, are. Maybe we'll have an <laughs> episode another time of just... Uh, yeah. Right. Now, I do, I do have a very old AGFA flatbed scanner, which I'm planning to use. For paper and eggs eventually um so that's where i'm at that gives me results that i like um but it's all a little bit of a hassle there's just no easy way to digitize film and get really good results it seems like you've got to you've got to work at it oh there is I'm... an easy way nick <laughs> <laughs> By the and way, I, I love you. About it. <laughs> I'm really hoping that the subtitles that come up on uh, YouTube are a lot better than the subtitles that are recording software, uh, because um, it was rather than uh, paper and eggs, it was paper and eggs. Hmm. Uh, <laughs> so anyway, that. I'm sorry to do that, I'm Ethan. Sure. Ethan, well, what is it? We how should, do you do yours? Should... Um, hey, Graham, you're, okay, your camera is off. We'll fix it. So. Um, I also have an Epson flatbed that I use quite frequently for all sorts of formats of film. Um, but, you know, we'll talk about sort of where uh, mirrorless and DSLR scanning came from. But um, I've been using this thing. And, you know, I'm aware of like the negative supply and the pixelator. In fact, I became aware of the pixelator almost as soon as I got into the camera biz because... Okay. It, yeah. So before before we go too far into that, Ethan has just held up uh, a device that has it, it's essentially a dual rail. It's not a monorail. It's a dual rail adapter for uh, 35 millimeter cameras. It will lock into your um, to your camera mount on one side, into your lens mount on one side, and then it has a, um, a another lens mount on the other side. And it's got a bellows in between. And it is a macro rig, right? Yeah, so it's, it's, yeah. this is the Nikon macro bellows or macro rail. Uh, it's uh -huh. for the F. It's a real old one. Right. And oh, it has this, I, it has this slide copying attachment on it. That's where I'm going. So I want to back it up just a little bit is, um, so I became aware of like the pixelator, um, when I started, uh, selling cameras in the very beginning, Hamish was running the pixelator campaign at the same time as my first Kickstarter campaign. 
And I think for a lot of reasons that makes sense, right? So like I love the Paycon because it was fast, but it's also very low resolution, low bit depth. They're now selling for over $1,100 on eBay. They're full of dust. They're hard to clean. And, you know, they use a bunch of like small plastic parts and optics and like if a lens goes yellow, where are you going to get another lens? If it's yeah, but there. they do a 36 uh, frame roll of film in two minutes. Uh, closer to four. Four. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. At at six megapixels and shallow bit depth. But yeah, I mean, I think the Paycon is great. That was sort of my. I never owned one, but I got plenty of film scanned on Paycons uh, back in the day. I I, I loved it. Um, but you know. Uh, I want, I would use a Paycon scan, you know, back in the day, I'd get like the photo CD and then figure out what I liked and then put that on my flatbed and scan it. Right. Uh, which I think is a pretty common process for a lot of folks. Um, I wouldn't make a large print from a, a Paycon and sometimes not even like internet stuff, but, um, you know, I had used and had uh, Nikon cool scans uh, over the years, and those are pretty good, but again, filled with dust. You can't fix them. Uh, you can't get parts. They're super duper slow. It takes like 45 minutes to scan a roll of film, just like my Epson flatbed. And so I had this thing laying around. Uh, it's a Nikon uh, macro rail or macro bellows. Um, so basically, instead of having, it's got these rails, right? And they extend. Um, and so instead of having an uh, extension tube on your lens, you have this adjustable bellows, uh, which doesn't give you swing or tilt or anything. It's perfectly rectilinear, but you can get extreme extension. Um, and then on the front, it has this thing, uh, which is a slide copying adapter, uh, which is another bellows. And like, uh, it's basically just a hood bellows, right? So you put your lens uh, on the first bellows and then you clip the bellows hood uh, to eliminate any uh, stray reflections to your lens. Um, and then you could drop a slide in the end here and it's got a little piece of acrylic as a diffuser. Um, but what I really liked about this one, um, and I think I just had this from my buying and selling cameras days is it has these two trays that you can put a roll of film on and just run it through the film gate. Oh, that's and, nice. Yeah. And so, you know, it takes me five or six minutes manually like to scroll the film through by hand and then, uh, take the picture and then scroll the film through by hand. But, you know, I've been using it with a 55.35 micro Nikkor, which is really sharp um, and rectilinear and doesn't have much fall off. And a Sony a7 that's like 21 megapixels. Um, and it's been a really nice way to digitize film. It's still, you know, kind of slow and like I can't really walk away and do something else while it's doing its thing, right? You do 10 rolls of film and there's an afternoon. In fact, uh, my friend Gerson, who is uh, a lot younger than me, but getting into film photography, would come over once a month with uh, all of his film, and he'd spend four hours uh, with my setup digitizing while I assembled cameras, which was, you know, pretty nice to hang out and keep me company while I was building cameras. Although, like every twenty minutes, he would make me stop what I was doing to show me, you know, uh, the the good frames. Um, mm. But this has been my solution for a long time. Um, you know, one thing that I learned is that um, I could use a light box uh, or even just a window to illuminate this uh, acrylic uh, diffuser here. Um, but I started using a flash because it was perfectly daylight balanced yeah. and mm -hmm. really quick. I could I could bounce a flash off of a white piece of paper and point uh, this rig at a white piece of paper and you know shoot it um 125th of a second or something it didn't have to wait for my dim light box and the colors were perfect on slides or color and eggs and uh you know i thought this was a really good setup i thought it was you know as good as something like the pixelator just for this one format which is the reason why i did not buy a pixelator although i'm gonna buy one it's it's out now i, I got other formats to scan um mm -hmm. but it you know it was um a lot cheaper than a negative supply, particularly because I had mine already and it was free. Um, and it's also like nice, heavy steel, uh, except for the bellows, which is very fragile actually. These are from the seventies, I think. But um, yeah, I, I really I really dug this setup for a good long time. And that kind of leads me into uh, what we're gonna talk about today. 
Hey, Nick and Graham, are, are you ready to start the podcast or you got some questions about the... Uh... No, let's, let's start the Home Main Camera podcast. Okay. Yep. So today uh, we're going to do the rare episode where I actually have something to show that I've been working on for months and months. Um, I'm going to tell you guys a little bit about um, the genesis of the project and the why, which we kind of covered in the uh, cold open. And then um, I'm going to show you the product and then we're going to go back through four or five months worth of prototypes and look at uh, sketches and uh, engineering drawings and CAD models and kind of kind of take you through the process of how I brought something I'm pretty proud of from an idea into life. So um, we start off the podcast talking about scanning um, and particularly DSLR mirrorless uh, camera scanning. And I think the real reason behind that is because, you know, they stopped making good scanners basically around 2001 to 2003, right? And so they're all getting old and expensive and hard to find and hard to find parts for and, and they're not... a, a perfect example is what we just mentioned. I have um, the um, V700, and the V700, the preview is is four to five minutes. You know, that's how long it takes from the point, you know, because it's an old operating system in the scanner. It's a new computer. Sure. If they have, um, Epson came out with a new version of the software, but... It, it's yeah. even it's like it's running on flash or something. Um, yeah, even how uh, flatbed scanners work yeah. mechanically using a light bar and, a, and an array of pixels. micro stepper. Yeah, yeah, it's ne a flatbed is never going to be super fast. Uh, not right. the resolution we want. And so, like they had solutions like the Nikon Cool Scan or the Paycon that were relatively fast well the Pacon was fast it was like three and a half four minutes um but it was really low resolution i think the Pacon was using you know an imaging sensor rather than an imaging bar um and then the nikon was incredibly slow but you know Pacon is eleven hundred dollars now and a nikon is maybe five to eight hundred dollars and um the other thing is like digital cameras have gotten really really good their bit depth has gone up their color rendition has gotten better their resolution has gotten crazy. I'm talking to you guys right now on a 22 megapixel Sony Alpha series that I bought for $200 with a lens. Like this thing can digitize film way better than any scanner I can buy before, like a drum scanner. Right? Um, and so traditionally, uh, traditionally, the last couple of years I've been using this thing with a micro Nikkor, um, this is the, the uh, macro bellows for those of you just listening. Um, mm -hmm. But it was slow, and so I've had this idea for a long time. I'm I'm very intrigued. I bought a 3D printer originally before I made my first camera for the purpose of repurposing it into a laser etcher for making PCBs, uh, circuit boards, um, which never materialized. I am able to make PCBs in other ways now, and I got into 3D printing. But I have always, since the beginning of being interested in 3D printing, been interested in using that incredibly cheap hardware um, as like as a way of doing. Let's take a time note. Let's take a time note. Uh, uh, you're vertically stretched. Yeah, yeah. I just 34. realized that. Yeah. Um, I may have been vertically stretched this whole time. No, you no, no. It, it suddenly happened it in the middle of your presentation. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Nope. Stretched. Hold on. Sorry, guys. That's all right. No, not a problem. Uh, I, I, I didn't want you to, uh, to go too far down that path. Yep. And. Yeah, I mean, there's different ways to make yourself look like a highbrow. That's not one of them. Yeah. <laughs> Especially not with that hat. I should go get my hat, my photographer's hat. 
Um, well, you know, you need your scanner's hat. <laughs> I think what I, which don't you want a green eye shade with a with a, with a headband? That oh be. yeah, 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 yeah. Well, my typographer's hat. That's what that is. That's your typographer's hat. That's your uh, uh, be, be good, good general purpose Florida accessory as well. Um, hey guys, I'm gonna <laughs> give me give me a minute. I gotta sure. Yeah. Oh yeah. So the the. Do you what are, what is what's the software you're using to deal with your uh, camera scans when you have you tried when you try to do that? Oh, and just Photoshop because and okay, the reason yeah. why I well, use so Photoshop. Well, hang on a second. Don't tell me Lightroom, but the reason no, why no. I use Photoshop is I have uh, 20 years of experience with Photoshop, and anything that you can do in Lightroom, you can do in Photoshop. Except I'm not going to tell you you have that. plugins with Lightroom. I'm not going to. Yeah, I'm not going to tell you to use Lightroom, but if you have it, you uh -huh. can process your raw files in there and then take them straight into Photoshop. Because uh, what I find with big film is it really pays to take two or three shots and stitch them, which you can do in oh, either program. Right. But the, the trick is this, with the Fuji files, it, it really can help to use this. And it's a Lightroom thing that comes with Lightroom. You don't have to yeah. add it. Okay. Enhance details to the raw files and then just go straight into Photoshop and do everything else there. Um, it's okay. just, okay. it's, ju it's, it's a thing so that sometimes the colors go wonky and that'll fix it. Yeah. Ethan, you're still, uh, you're still yeah, skinny. Yeah. Nothing, huh? No, it just suddenly happened. So something must have changed modes on you. Yeah. Yep. Uh, <laughs> well, the video's not stretched. Yeah, uh, I'll be right back. I'm I mean, gonna, the audio's I'm not gonna stretched. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> By the way, um, when we come back, um, uh, you were talking about um, how. Oh, we're we're back. We're good. Oh, that's mm -hmm. a different mm -hmm. camera, isn't it? Well, uh, let's see. Different, different focal length, anyway. Um, but uh, no, I just rebooted the camera. Okay, that looks. Yeah, good. I'll be right back. I'm just yeah, I'm gonna take better. a break. It's <laughs> much I drank so much coffee this morning. All right. Oh, fine. I get up and everybody leaves. Oh. Do you see, guys, what I have to put up with? These people. I'm telling you, these people. Ethan, I really like the fabric that is on your chair. I think that that's very cool. I'm sure you can hear me way back in the background. But I love the fabrics on that chair. Oh, I think that was Nick clearing his throat. Maybe he's in the bathroom. Maybe that wasn't clearing his throat because the bathroom's right around. Oh, no, I don't know. He's in the library. Oh. 
Hey, Nick, take a look at the uh, fabric that's on the back of the chair that Ethan's sitting in. Uh, okay. See, I think, oh, I can barely see it sticking up there. Oh, there we, oh. Go. There we go. There it is. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's pretty nice. Uh, that is that, nice. You know, that's like actually, that. what that is, is a reproduction of some um, medieval tapestries that are actually in the cloisters at the north end of Manhattan. Oh, really? They're, they're real famous. They're full of unicorns. Oh, uh, really? They're actually incredible to see if you've yeah. ever. The cloisters is a real interesting uh, place. It's just kind of like a, I don't know, a monastery or something at the very, on this high rocky promontory at the very north end of, of Manhattan. Hmm. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So um, the I do, I'm pretty, I think I still have the macro, uh, micro Nikkor 3.5 that somebody wanted me to sell for them. Um, uh -huh. and it, they don't go for a lot. So I, I'm sure um, we could do get, a, get you a really low price for it and give them a few bucks. And yeah. It be, yeah. And you yeah, could send that out. You could send that out to, um, uh, in tomorrow's post with the fixed um, uh, <laughs> uh, what, uh, um, lenses I sent to, or shutters I sent to you. Well, uh, maybe another couple of days on that. Yeah. I'm going to try to do this without uh, reading glasses on uh, to get rid of that glare. And it, it makes me less likely to stare at this the uh, computer screen. Today. Yeah. Good point. Good point. Uh, Although, I turned, what is I nice keep... is weird. when Ethan left and came back, now he is level on my screen with my lens, so I'm not looking up at him um, for this, ah. so, which is good. Huh, he's still on the bottom of my screen. Yeah, well, he w it, that's where he, yeah, he's at the bottom now. He was at, uh, higher up, which is different. So, okay, um, Ethan, you were talking about um, the quality of Camera. sensors. Okay, yeah. Um, but let me ask you a question. Let me ask you a question about, um, uh, so that we can cut to me and yeah, then right, you can cut right. back to you. Um, but let me ask you, actually, let me ask you a question about that, um, uh, your what you've got in your hand the um yeah. the, the slide macro yeah, bellows kind of whenever you, you know just come in <clears throat> yeah here um okay so uh i'll come in on, in uh about 15 seconds here 42 dot 45 five more seconds just i don't know why did that long. Ethan, are those um, are those bellows? Are they uh, you know the, those slide bellows things? Are they available for pretty much any camera mount? Like uh, you, like you said, that's is specific for Nikon. If I have a bunch of Canon lenses, uh, or you know Canon FD lenses, or I have a uh, a bunch of Pentax lenses, did they make those for all those different kinds of? Uh, yeah. So um, I definitely have like a Canon FD uh, bellows that's the same, or I had one. I don't remember if I sold it or not. Um, you know, a lot of companies that were making cameras in the 70s made this particularly for making internegatives and slide duplication. Um, they also made these lenses basically with this piece built in for exactly the same purpose, and it's just, you know, a metal tube. Um, you don't have as many lens options, right? You just stick the whole thing on your body. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I think they cost like 70 to 100 bucks at B&H or Adorama. They make yeah. all different mounts. And then the other thing is because you're pushing the lens so far forward, you can make almost any lens adapt, right? Um, it doesn't need to meet the flange distance for infinity focus because, um, you know, you're focusing only a few inches away. So you just use an adapter if you want to put an M42 on the Nikon macro bellows. Oh, okay. I, I also want to comment that these were not primarily for uh, copying film. They were for close macro work, and it, it gives you precise focus control. The other thing about these is that if you get into the bigger ones, they made them for medium format. Um, large format is already a macro bellows. But for medium format, there's one for Mamiya 645 
that actually has full movements on the front standard mm -hmm. and you can really use it like a, a super close up um, large format system to, to to play with perspective and all that stuff yeah but then don't you need a leaf back for your my mimia 645 no um, you shoot film <laughs> <laughs> oh wait hold on you're digitizing film by shooting film right. I mean, so this was not. I mean, this was designed in the '60s or '70s. It was not oh. for digitizing film, right? It was for shooting pictures of, uh, you know, tiny little things, uh, coins or diamonds. But yeah, I, I have to comment before we lose this. You do not need a leaf back. I shoot. I shoot through the Mamiya system with my Fuji. There is an adapter for that. Oh, right. For for shift stitching, so you can okay. make high resolution shots through that system as well. Okay. You just need to spend hours stitching. But yeah, so the no, no, stitching is almost separate. instantaneous. Uh -huh. it, takes, okay. it takes a couple minutes. Nothing. Okay. <laughs> um, so, you know, kind of back to what we were talking uh -huh. about is um, cameras are uh, getting really good and really cheap. Uh, macro lenses are plentiful. And so a lot of people have switched over to scanning with a digital camera right? and and you can make now for a couple hundred bucks you can buy a 50 megapixel canon or sony or nikon and uh you know a pixelator or a negative supply and that's less money than a paycon and it will give mm -hmm. you a way better result than pretty much anything but a drum scanner and so um I have been fascinated with using 3D printer parts for building other things, and I build electronics professionally. And so I've had this idea in my head forever to build kind of like an automated, um, not film scanner, but automated negative carrier. Um, so I, I think you guys remember around uh, March and April, I was really checked out. I was, uh, you know, in the middle of quarantine and I was working on this ventilator 15 hours a day for a couple of months straight and really didn't have much uh, time and energy to think about photography. And like I didn't leave my house and I had nothing to take pictures of. And it, you know, it just seemed like. I don't know. My heart wasn't in it for a little while. And so I actually put that out um, about four or five months ago and I was, you know, done. And I hadn't had a day to just sit around with nothing to do, you know, a couple orders to fill, but like nothing that I needed to really work my brain around. And I was feeling really down. Like, you know, I, for a while considered that I might need to leave the podcast because I was bringing you guys down just wanting to talk about ventilator parts all the time and like yeah we we had a plot to kick you out um yeah. and but it's just i couldn't get uh i couldn't get a quorum of 100 percent. we were just 50 percent voting one <laughs> way and the other so we we let you stay thanks thanks <laughs> i appreciate it um the thing is like you would just have to spend twice as much time podcasting because then i would still want to talk to you every week or two. <laughs> you we would have to rebut your rebut yeah uh, emails yeah. but so um i was feeling like really down and exhausted and uh, how does this relate to photography but I, you know today i sort of wanted to talk about the process of bringing something to market and everything around that which is sort of a personal story more than um electronics but we'll get into electronics and so um i've been really lucky like we have never met in person i think i know mm -hmm. you guys pretty well and and Probably the best thing about um, running Camera Dactyl has been that I've got to meet these people all over the world who share my interests and passions. Some of them are really smart. And like, so I've got this friend, M. He runs Emulsive. I consider us friends, even though we have somewhat of a business relationship. I don't know what his real name is. I've never met him in person. And I don't even know what he looks like. Uh, but I talked to M pretty frequently about business and life and fountain pens. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, I was sort of like at a, at a point where I didn't know what to do next. I was feeling pretty down. I had 50 plus things in my dream camera journal that I could pick up. And I was really hesitant to pick up another project that might go on for months and months and, you know, either hit a stumbling block that would prevent me from releasing it or, um, just you know make something that would uh take 
six months to make and pull in $15,000 like the Bronco pan or, you know, I, I didn't know where to go. And so basically I called M for a pep talk and he's been really like generous with his uh, time and advice. And uh, we talked for like an hour or two and um, he got me much more excited to work on film, uh, film equipment again. And um, yeah, I, I owe him like a big debt of gratitude. Like sometimes we like to do a little segment of like people who have, pushed us forward in this and M really, you know, has done that for me a lot of times and has always been like a good cheerleader. But this one time about four or five months ago was like, I was considering leaving the biz and just like getting a job for a biotech company and M kind of talked me off the edge. Uh, and so I told M like kind of my predicament as I explained it to you guys. And um, I, showed him um did that stretch me nope. no you're good uh no. i i showed him or told him about you know a couple dozen of the projects that i had in my dream camera journal and i said look you know i, I don't know what i'm gonna work on next like i need it to be sort of profitable if i'm going to spend months on it even though i'll be filling orders for existing cameras and i want it to be something that people will use but i also want it to be like an easy win. I don't, I don't want to spend another, you know, three months building a ventilator that I give out to the world. And then like some people might use it. Some people won't like, I want it to be an adopted thing that, you know, I won't have to buy 20 grand worth of equipment to manufacture and, and that I could do in a few weeks. And getting feedback is, is something that's, you know, uh, you put the, you know, you were part of a team that put a ventilator out there. Um, but you'll never know how many or if it saves anybody's lives or whether it becomes adopted at a hospital or whether it becomes i think you're know, actually building one in algeria right now but like to what extent i you know i don't know and you'll never know right and like it's it's been really satisfying like um even uh, a couple of weeks ago, ago, there were two different articles on Emulsive of people that I don't know building Bronco pans and using them. Somebody like put out a YouTube video. I get uh, comments mm -hmm. every couple of weeks about a shutter tester that I built and put on GitHub. And so, you know, the photo community has been really kind of amazing in that regard. Um, anyway, I pitched M like a bunch of my different projects and said, like, these are the ones I'm considering getting into, but I'm not sure, you know, what is what is a good one to work on, right? And that's kind of like where a lot of these things start. And so I pitched him ultra large format cameras and box cameras and self-developing backs and ultra large format lenses and giant copal shutters. Like all of these things are things I have in some phase of development. Um, and just staying on track for one thing is really important to be able to bring something to market eventually instead of having you know, shelves of dozens of not working prototypes. And so um, there was one that M got really excited about, which was this one, and he pushed me to do it and uh, got me excited about it, um, which was building a negative carrier that would advance film automatically and trigger a camera and then advance film and repeat through an entire roll. Um, mm -hmm. Because you could now buy for peanuts, you know, 40, 50 megapixel camera with great bit depth and great color rendition. Wait, wait, back up there. Uh, how many peanuts for a 40 or 50 megapixel camera? About um, 800 peanuts. 800 peanuts? Okay. Yeah. Um, but, you know, okay, it's not free, but like for $200, yeah. you could buy a 20 megapixel right. camera. Well, here's the deal, is that you can beat pa pack on for a camera that you can get at Goodwill. Yeah, yeah, of course. So, yeah. You just couldn't do it for speed right now. Right. And so um, M got me really excited about it. And I said, OK, I think I can have a working prototype in two weeks, which I did. <laughs> <laughs> but then it went on for another four months. <clears throat> so um, what I'd like to do now is show you guys the final working prototype. And then we'll go back through, like, I have laid out here all of the old prototypes. I have one, two, three, four, five, six, six or seven that are not being released and one that is. Um, and then I've got all sorts of drawings and uh, CAD models and electrical schematics. And for our um, 
podcast listeners, if you're in a car, you're commuting or you're vacuuming or whatever it is that you're doing, uh, we'll do our best to describe these, but also on the YouTube channel, you'll be able to, uh, you know, fast forward, take a look at those things um, as, we're, as we're doing it. Uh, and this is, you know, part of the deal of simulcasting, simulpotting, simul ewing. Uh, hey, come on, uh, get, help me coin this phrase. Help me. Uh, Graham, why don't you take a time note now while I set this thing? <laughs> So I'm going to get into uh, sort of the process of this thing, but I thought I would start by just showing you what I came up with and what I'm going to release on Kickstarter, I guess, um, in a week or two when this thing uh, comes out, um, or maybe around when this episode comes out. So um, this is the Camerodactyl Mongoose. Um, it's a 35 millimeter film, uh, not a film scanner, a, a negative carrier. Uh, that advances film automatically and uh, triggers your camera. So it's got two parts. It's got this film scanning module uh, with a film gate in it. And then you stick your film in this side. I can get some light on it. There we go. Right. Can, okay, I, so can I interrupt and ask you what is yeah. the shape of what is the shape of that film gate or the, the aspect ratio? Oh, yeah. So um, I made the aspect ratio. Uh, it's like 27 by 68. So it'll do X pan. It'll do Bronco pan. It'll do half frame. Um, you can scan pretty much anything that people shoot on 35 millimeter. And we're going to get just a little bit of sprockets on that. Now, uh, let me describe this. Um, this is a uh, black 3D printed um, uh, plastic device. It's got a bunch of screws on it. But it it, it has two major components. It has a um, uh, a window that the film will sit through. And then it has, uh, I guess, a film advance uh, uh, portion. It yeah. does not have a picture of a mongoose anywhere on it. I'm looking for it. I don't see that. Um, um, it'll have some laser cut branding on the control module. Uh, okay. But, you know, okay. basically, um, and we'll take a look at some of the CAD drawings from SolidWorks. But, um, you know, it's it's got this film gate section and uh, advanced sprockets in one half and then the other half houses a bunch of electronics and a motor. It actually weighs about a pound and a half and it's you could kick this thing down a flight of stairs. It is and how, how big what would you relate the size to? Um it is about the size of um about the size of what? It, <laughs> an interesting question. Um so it's a little uh, cigar box. Yeah, yeah, okay. Cigar box. Seven by five by three inches. It's it's uh, smaller than a cigar box. Um, it's very dense. Um, it's also got a control module, uh, which does a bunch of things. And, and, and that is a separate box. A separate box, yeah. Okay. So um, this is the control module right now. I actually miscut this one piece uh, so it doesn't fit perfectly and with the electronics, but... Uh, basically, it's a laser cut um, box, which I'm not sure that the eventual control module that I release will uh, be laser cut or 3D printed or and, what. Okay, so it's got four buttons across the front, um, a yellow button, a red button, a green button, and a blue button. It has a dial that looks like a guitar knob yeah. dial. And For then it you electronicists, it's a rotary encoder with a push button, so it's actually a fifth button. Okay, there we go. And then it's also got an LCD screen that is um, is wide um, uh, as opposed to long. Yeah. Um, or as, as opposed to square or rectangular. It's a, it's a long rectangle. Yeah. So. And then on this side, it's got, or on this side, it has a power switch to turn it on and off. And then over here, it has jacks for uh, power input, which powers and the entire device and it uh, looks like there are three um three ether ethernet at five yeah, yeah. ethernet rj45 connectors or ap8c connectors 
three Ethan Ethernet. Um, you know, when I was a kid, my dad set up Ethernet through the house with all these wires, and I thought he was just joking and called it Ethernet. It took a few years to figure it out. Uh, my dad was a computer guy, but um, so it's got three Ethernet ports. We're actually only going to talk about this one Ethernet port. It does some secret functions, which I won't tell people about for uh, quite a while. Um, and then, oh, is, are th is that your going to be your stretch goal? Is that people are going to be? No, able I'm not even going to talk about it on the Kickstarter. You know, okay, I'm okay if you know 200 people who see this podcast know Just that. Uh, don't plug it ports. into the secret ports. That's in <laughs> that's in the redacted manual. Sure. Okay. Um, <laughs> it won't do anything if you plug it into the secret ports, but um, it also won't work. But yeah, I, <clears throat> there's. There was a point where I needed to use a bigger microcontroller uh, because the program I had written was so big it didn't fit on the flash memory of, you know, a little guy like this. Um, and so I had all of this extra flash memory, so I wrote some other programs that does something. Okay. Anyway, we're not, let's forget about that for now. You don't okay. see these two ports. It's got this one RJ45 connector, which controls the uh, scanner module. We'll plug that in a minute. It's got a power connector, and then it's got um, a mini plug that goes to your uh, camera, like a standard camera, um, uh, what do you say? Uh, uh, tr tr uh, cutter trigger. Um, yeah. So like if you have an intervolerometer um, or, or a corded remote for your digital camera, it's the same little... Um, remote shutter release. Yeah, uh, eighth, eighth inch... Um, uh, plug like a um, a headphone jack. Yeah, exactly. It's uh, it's this mini plug on this side, and then you know, yeah. Canon, Nikon, and Sony all have a different plug on their end. But you can buy them for like ten bucks. I will include them with the scanners. And uh, yeah, I spent a hundred bucks on stupid cords to get out with my uh, with my tester units. But okay, uh, yeah. So yeah, and I want to point out those tester units. I didn't get one. I know you guys get around two or three. Yeah, you will. I mean, there are no tester units, yeah. so far, right? There's. He there. doesn't love us. I do love you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so <clears throat> that plugs into your camera, and and the control box can trigger your camera, and um, you know, uh, work the film gate. So I designed it so you could stand it up like this and run film through horizontally. Uh, if you were, let's say, using a tripod to photograph this way. Uh, with either you know a uh, light box that's standing up or a flash through the back or a flash being bounced off of something. Or if you had a light box, you could sit it down like this and point the camera from above with a copy stand or some sort of like Benbow tripod. Uh, for today, I'm just gonna demo it like this because it's uh, you know easier with the camera facing me. Um, so, uh, Ethan is plugging in um, one uh, the control box into uh, the scanner box. Into so the, yeah, the scanner only has one connection. It's this uh, Cat5 or, or RJ5 okay. connector. Plugs in here. I'll probably standardize the color of these cords, but that's what I got. And then uh, the control box is here. You turn it on. See if I can work this thing backwards. Um, and now, and now, I want to say that Ethan is signaling to his wife to attach the lightning mast to the power input. <laughs> <laughs> it's alive. Okay, so uh, it's got a bunch of modes. I'm going to show you some of the modes um, now. This is my dirty roll of film that I keep on the ground. Okay. But and this is a 35 millimeter roll of film that he is putting in uh, through that film gate. And he's just pushed it in. The thing around um, so I can see it. But, um, in fact, let's get a white piece of paper so you can see what's going on here. Um, Okay, so today I'm not going to set up a light table or whatnot because we're just talking on a podcast. I'm just going to use this piece of paper to reflect a little light so we can see through the film gate. But you would have some light source here. Um, so this thing has three main modes uh, with the scanner module connected. Um, the first is oops, uh, this manual mode where I don't know if you guys can see, but um, I 
I have this whole thing resonating on all these empty boxes. So it's going to be a yeah. little bit, but um, I can. And so what's, what's happening when you hear that sound, uh, what's happening is the film itself is moving back and forth, left to right through that film gate. And I believe he's just getting to a registration point. Am I right? Uh, no, I'm just feeding the film in. Um, okay. So there's a manual mode here um, that allows you to scroll the film slowly or <clears throat> change the scroll speed to a medium or even a very fast speed. Um, okay. <clears throat> And then also in manual mode, I'm just going to put this digital camera over here. Uh, if I was using it to actually scan film, I would, um, you know, put a macro lens on it and put it on a tripod roughly in the position that my webcam is. But, you know, you can imagine that this thing is focused uh, on the film gate. But I'm just going to use this here so that you can see when it takes pictures. So um, I can manually trigger. Uh, a photo, so I could use this just like a negative supply. So it, I would and this is that. sorry. And that is Ethan um, pressing a button on the control box, and what that does is it um, it takes a picture and then advances the film. Am I right? Well, with so that? I have this in manual mode right now, so all okay. it's doing is I'm manually advancing. Then I'm taking a picture, right? And I can also adjust micro position like this and take another picture. Um, and so you might ask like, why in the world would somebody want such a thing, right? Like it, it is just a loud negative supply where you don't have to, uh, you know, touch the thing. So actually I was originally gonna build all of this into one box, uh, but M later on convinced me that um, I should, um, Separate the control from yeah, the, right. from and, the yeah. and the reason was is I wanted to make an all-in-one box you could just mount your camera to M says look everybody's gonna have different cameras they're gonna have different setups and also there's an unforeseen benefit which is that you don't actually have to touch the scanner box ever right and so you're never jostling or changing focus you know you put this a foot away on your desk and then when you push buttons you're not actually touching the film. Mm -hmm. so you're isolating vibration from it. You yeah. vibrate or, be, or being nudged, nudged out of the of the plane of focus. You know that kind of thing. Yeah, exactly. And and so that's like one very small benefit over like a negative supply or or um, you know even that uh, Nikon macro bellows that I have. But I don't think that that is really worth buying one of these things. They're going to be pretty expensive. So. Um, and that wasn't my original point at all, uh, was to make something that electronically advanced. But I did want to um, make it automatically advance and take a picture and so on and so forth. So the first mode that I wrote uh, was just, uh, I call this fast mode, which basically just uh, only works with evenly spaced frames on your film. So like, if you use a Bronco pan or a Nikon F3 that puts all of the frames exactly the same distance apart, this will work. If you use a Zorky or a really old Leica that has differential frame spacing, you're going to have some drift. And you might be able to make it work, but it's really not ideal. But could you, could you just um, move the, you know, essentially move the camera back a little bit and then include yeah. the area around and just let that drift be? Yeah, you could, but you know, on a roll of thirty-six, it depends how big oh. it is on the camera taking the picture, and um, it's not ideal. But I have a solution for that. We'll get to that. But okay, um, this thing uh, will do an entire roll in about forty seconds if they're evenly spaced. So um, all I have to do. So there's a. I'll get into like some of the calibration features that I've put. Mm -hmm. This is already calibrated for this film. But if I press start. Okay. And each time we hear that, um, the camera, the camera, there we go. Okay. 
Boy, that that's fascinating audio. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Okay. so each each time we were hearing that, we, you were hearing the the click of the shutter, the advancement of the film, and then click of the shutter, advancement of film, click of the shutter. So um, if you're putting in uncut uh, 36 exposure roll, you're you're put it in there done. Right. Um, yeah. yeah. So basically, if if it's um, uncut film and it's evenly spaced you can do a roll of 36 at as high resolution as your camera will make which this one's 21 megapixels but it's pretty easy to buy 40 or 50 these days in 40 seconds and as soon as i like figured that out i started calling it the mongoose because it is quick and it snakes and snakes of film ah there we go i was wondering where they, where, where we're yeah, going to talk about snakes and there's another uh, comment. I noticed in the background that Trudy was very interested in the automated yeah. process. And I want to know, do, do you feed your dog using an electronic uh, can opener? Um, Trudy, very much, <laughs> is somebody, this is Trudy back there. Um, uh, Trudy is very excited over anything that eats snakes is, is the deal. Uh, so this, okay, so that's the mongoose. It eats snakes and snakes of film. Uh, I, I like that idea. I was wondering where where we were going to get the get that name connection. So, um, so I'm I'm thinking that this could be, you know, like there. I have a a five thirty five millimeter roll or, or um, uh, development tank, and I very rarely develop just one tank. So uh, I can see that this has just taken um, one minute more... to do each roll with loading. Say that again. One minute to do each roll with loading time. So you have just eliminated four hours of scanning out of my day, or six hours of scanning out of hey, my day. Hey, do the commercial, Graham. Commercial <laughs> <laughs> process today. Yeah, no. So I, I did not expect it to be this fast. Um, uh -huh. I was pleasantly surprised, and I'll show you some old videos when we get back to you know original prototypes and the build process. Um, where actually, I thought about building some shutters with a similar mechanism here, but um, yeah, it was surprisingly quick. Um, I would have been happy if it could do a roll in you know five or ten minutes, but uh, one minute is or forty seconds is really, really crazy. This so, is. This so is I, I have to yeah I have to comment that my uh, dedicated film scanner does nice work but it takes longer than that for to do one frame. Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean so when I was scanning on my flatbed I would do 35 minutes for 16 exposures. Uh, so it would take over an hour to do a roll. Um, and you know at like 12 megapixels it's okay but also like in every way this thing wins every time. Um, and so I've been really excited about it. So let me show you one more thing is um, we can get into, I built a lot of calibration stuff and I think we'll talk about that in the process. This does a lot of other things. And, um, you know, it took me a week and a half to get a working prototype and then months and months to build like a user interface where somebody doesn't have to change variables in a program to calibrate it and whatnot. But um, let's see, I'm going to quickly rewind the film. And then I'm going to go into automatic mode. So automatic. Oh come on! Click the knob. Um, automatic mode is a little bit slower than fast mode. It's still blazingly fast compared to pretty much anything out there, including the Paycon. Um, but what it does is, I spent a lot of time developing sensors and programs for detecting detecting the edges of frames for both. Uh, black and white and color negatives and color positives. Um, there's a set of sensors on both sides of uh, one side of the film gate, top and bottom, um, that I designed and built from scratch and had some boards and we'll look at those later. But um, basically they will detect through the film what is frame and what is uh, you know the space between frames. And so when I press start, what it's gonna do is it's going to um, scan about a frame and a half, two frames 
and build a baseline um, a baseline calibration for what is uh, between frames and what is frames. Then it will rewind and then it will advance one frame, uh, find the edge, align the picture uh, to wherever you want to align it that's user settable. And then it'll take a picture and then advance the frame, find the edge, align the picture, take the picture and continue. So, so this is for uh, a, a camera that would not give you perfect uh, spacing. frame spacing. So either a camera with a little wonky setup or plenty of cameras have things like my old Zorky does not, never did have even frame mm -hmm. spacing. And right. I would say like the majority of like vintage cameras do not, depending upon how that mechanism works or what condition the mechanisms in. I, I have um, the, the 35 millimeter camera I'm using um, most right now is a pocket point and shoot, a Ricoh R1S. Mm -hmm. And even though that was, you know, it's one of the ones where you put in the film, it advances it all the way. So it's, you know, as it exposes, it rolls it back into the can. Um, that that's all electronic controlled and boy, it doesn't space perfectly. Interesting. So that could be using like an IR sprocket detector from that era. I haven't looked at that yeah. specific camera, but that should be damn near perfect. But, uh, a lot of cameras have like a little bit of variability, even if they're designed not to, you know, 20, 30 years later by the time we're using right. them now. And so, um, I thought it was a must if you had automatic, uh, film advancement to be able to use it on every camera and be able to detect the edges of frames for alignment. So I'm gonna show you that right now and I'll try and talk loud over the sound of the scanner. The scanner is loud. It's not as loud as this when you don't have it on two empty cardboard boxes right next to your microphone, but that's what we're working with here today. So, so and also uh, for those of you with headphones, um, you're just listening to it on the podcast, here's a little warning for you to turn it down just a little bit. All right, so here goes, I'm gonna start the automatic uh, scan and it's going to first calibrate. Let's see. This maybe does not love that. There we go. So yeah, that's basically what it does. Okay. So yeah, that's what it does in automatic mode. It takes about a minute and 37 seconds to do uh, 36 frames that way. Um, and that can vary a little bit because you're allowed to change the amount of time that you trigger the camera for and the amount of time you wait for exposure. So like if I'm using a flash that recycles and it's shooting for 125th of a second, um, it's basically a minute and 36. But if I'm using a dim light box, or my camera has a shutter delay for some reason, I can make it slow down and wait for the camera. You know, you could take five minutes to do a roll of film if you were like, let's say shooting uh, through a pinhole or something crazy like that. But so I, I've just kind of thought of something there. It, it's finding the edge of the frame, right? Um, yeah. When it goes through this automatic mode. If, is there, um, have you worked with something, you know, like say you're taking, um, I'm, I'm thinking about slicing frame to frame. And sometimes if I'm shooting in very low light situations, yeah. I have difficulty seeing where that edge of the frame is. Absolutely. If you're taking a bunch of night shots at a party, you might not, Absolutely. Absolutely. You might not want to play it through automatic mode. Yes, that's something yeah. that uh, the Paycon has trouble with, the Nikon has trouble with. Basically anytime you uh, have a film fed through, they do a similar thing. And you need some edge there. So I actually spent a week, and we'll get to this, building a protocol within the scanner and settings so you can set um, sensitivity for that edge detection in automatic mode. And okay. so um, you can decrease the sensitivity a lot, which gives you a lot less false positives, uh, which means that, you know, if, if I took a picture of a black fence with vertical lines, it's looking for like a black edge. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's going to trip the thing up if those are totally black, right? And so mm -hmm. you might want to turn your sensitivity way down so it would skip those. Um, likewise, if uh, you have a very uh, undense negative where the whole thing is very light, you might want to turn the sensitivity way up. And that's an adjustment that goes from zero to 100. Mm -hmm. and, um, but if you're at the beach, 
you just flip it on automatically. So here, the deal is, you know, I've put uh, a lot of film through here, and I've purposefully underdeveloped film and purposefully curled films, like done done everything to make it hard, right? And basically, uh, ninety nine point nine percent of everything that I scan can be scanned at thirty eight percent sensitivity. Or, okay. Or, and really anywhere from like 28 to 70 will work fine on everything. In fact, like I suspect that most people will set it once and then they'd be done. Um, that being said, yeah, if you're shooting like purposeful pictures at night where there's no background, like automatic mode is not going to work. It's not going to work on a Paycon. It's not going to work on this thing. Um, you really have to have some edge, even a very faint edge I can detect, but no edge uh, is not good. And in that case, you know, you can either use it in manual mode for those couple of frames. Um, certainly, like if there's a couple of frames in a roll like that that have no edge, it might mess up and take a bunch of pictures in the middle there, but it'll get on to the rest of the pictures and scan the rest perfectly. And then you can scroll back and manually shoot those. Or if they're roughly evenly spaced, uh, you can use fast mode to do those, um, and then just you know uh, capture you know maybe a frame and a half with your camera and crop in because there will be some frame drift if you know they're not evenly spaced. But um, yeah, it it is not for every situation. It's for most situations. So a sprocket rocket where it's shooting all over the sprockets. Mm -hmm. It's not for that, is what you're. Yeah, thinking. it's not really. So I, the original one, I grabbed very little of the uh, sprocket holes because I wanted to show as much as possible, and it was an absolute must for me that you could see the full frame and some black border around it. And so, me too. Let's see. I, yeah, I don't want to scan a crop, right? So, um, I don't know if you can see it through here, but oh yeah, uh, we can, can see it. You can yeah. see. The, like a third of the sprockets on the top and bottom. And I used to have half of them showing, um, but that became harder to hold the film flat and stable and yeah. be really, really reliable. So like now I cut off another, you know, uh, sixth of those sprockets by moving the rails in and the film is like 100% flat and yeah. uh, feeds smoothly every time. And that was the thing I was willing to do. So, um, so that's my next question. Um, I have a couple of cans of Portra, un, unperforated Portra 160. Mm -hmm. um, so if I have unperforated 35 millimeter film, is this something that will, will it, yeah, will it be able to handle that or is it rolling through the sprockets? Yeah, it's, it's using sprocket wheels like this. Um, okay. Some early prototypes. And so the reason why I started with 35 instead of 120 was a uh, couple fold. There's one, I think um, negative supply makes a really beautiful, expensive, but beautiful solution that does 120 pretty quickly that uses rubber rollers. Uh -huh. uh, so it, you know, just touches the edge of the film. It doesn't scratch anything. Um, but that gives you a less positive registration. Right? Things can slip through rubber rollers. Not that they do. I think I could make one of these for 120. The other part about it is that you know, I have a lot of frozen rolls of 220, but really I shoot 120, right? And that's uh -huh. you know, it's being made. And so, you know, if I'm shooting six by six, I'm getting like 12 frames, in which case, you know, manually scrolling and taking a picture or manually scrolling is not that much slower than just sending it through. That being said, you know, it would take me two weeks to make Basically, this module uh, take 120, and uh, the, the program would be absolutely the same. Um, and so, I could make a 120 thing, but like this has to be well profitable before I start thinking about you know designing extra modules for it. But you know, that's one of the, like the secret bonuses of uh, having the control module and the scanner separate is that you know I could or not double the price for you know maybe 50 percent more or more. yeah okay i could just sell another one but <laughs> and, and i'm gonna I'll, can i break in and ask a question yeah. so i am very eager to see this uh the 120 version of this but it occurs to me that um you could do the manual version you could make 
you could make this work with just a rubber uh, crank and rubber wheels and crank the film through and use your manual setting. Right. So and, a person and, could almost make their own film carrier um, and your device would be able to take the picture. Yeah, I mean, the, the deal is though, like a negative supply already does that. And I think I might be able to, you know, we'll see what people want, right? Maybe I'm going to sell three of these and then it won't even be worth getting through FCC testing and it'll be done. Or maybe I'll sell a thousand and then, you know, the first thing I work on is a 120 version of it or a multi-format version of it. Um, I think it would be really cool for something like 110. Um, I want my four by five version where it has a stack of negatives and it just... It occurred to me, you know, so I have... I have researched how laser printers uh, feed and have a retard roller uh, feeding stacks of uh, films. It's a very um, interesting mm. solution. So mm. they have like two rollers that pull in and one that retards the paper in the other direction. So you only get one, uh, one sheet at a time. But like that's another problem for another day for sure. For now, you know, this does a specific thing, which is 35 millimeter perforated film in uncut rolls. It'll do cut rolls, but uh, cut rolls are going to be slow, right? You'd have to feed everyone in and start it uh, every four to six frames. Except Next. I'm thinking, what about the old slide projector method where you get a car you convert a carousel projector into yep. a, a feeder? And that would work for 120. They did make 120 projectors. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, in fact, I uh, have a friend of the family who's a photographer for Con Ed. I've, I've brought him up uh, a couple of times on the podcast. And he called and asked. Um, so he's got all of these slide carousels he wants to get rid of in his garage filled with slides from the 70s. And he wanted to mount his D800 looking at the film gate of the slide projector with the slide projector's lens removed. And he wanted a machine that would trigger the slide projector and then trigger the camera and then trigger the slide projector and trigger the camera, which is something that I'm working on for him. I think that's a very simple thing for me to do, but I need to know uh, how the how his slide projector, uh, you know, which pins to contact or, or what voltages to send. I don't have a slide projector, so I don't know. And I'm sure they're all a little bit different. But so well. so the, the crude version that I would do, it's just a rocker switch that would... <laughs> Would fire uh -huh. one then the other you know <laughs> well yeah but that there's i mean it's simple enough and you could probably do it with just this control box in another module which is something for you know the follow-up episode after my kickstarter and what these other two ports do but um yeah i mean it's it should be pretty easy to dial in like uh you know turn the projector on wait for this many seconds fire the camera wait for this many seconds repeat yeah. And so I, with I, the right with the right clockwork, you could simply use a gerbil wheel and have the gerbil run it. You know, it is so much harder to build mechanical systems than electromechanical <laughs> systems to do the same thing, right? Writing a computer program is so much easier than figuring out uh, the tolerances of all of these gears. Uh, you know, like it's it either works or it doesn't work, and you can debug it and. You can change a line. You don't have to like spend an hour printing each one of these. This, this took me a day before I had a thing that did not uh, shred. He, was just, um, he just showed us a, a stack of um, of the sprocket wheels. That yeah, 20, 20 something sprocket wheels. Each of them ate film before I had a reason. So I need to I need to channel the long lost beastie Mike G. So uh, do you have a version that will uh, do APS film? Because APS film, it's the latest thing in film photography. It's taking over the world by storm. No, I do not. I think probably, like, you know, it's a niche thing and it's going to be expensive. And we'll talk about that later. And it, it took four or five months to bring to market. It's going to eat three grand going through FCC testing plus another month of my time. Like, yeah, I, I need to sell hundreds of them. I mean... Okay, I would probably have done it anyway at some point, but like if I sell less than a hundred, no more mongoose products will be released. You know, like it's then yeah. the people who have them will enjoy them and that's it, right? If I sell two hundred of them, that's you know, profitable enough at that point that it pays to make I would do one twenty way before APS for sure. I've 
I've got a question, uh, and maybe Ethan, since you bought out all those um, camera stores, there this had to exist for those. And I just made a joke with the APS, but you know, this this there had to be something almost identical to this for APS back right. in the day. What happened to all those scanners? Right. So I think um, I think it's the Cool Scan two or four thousand has. Uh, an APS feeder in it, just like, you know, so the the cool scans were these tall boxes and I forget which models, but a bunch of them had, you know, right. cartridge juice stuck in and out and that cartridge would feed different types of film and interface with okay. the scan. And so I think what's like unique about this is that, you know, scanners had this capability. They certainly had some sort of edge detection, whether it was, you know, with a scanner bar or a separate set of sensors, I don't know, I have not read those patents. Um, I haven't. And, and mini labs had to have that. You know, that's exactly what a mini, uh, you know, the mini lab printer. Right. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, I think for the most part, you know, they would have had something like that. And then I actually thought about making, so part of what this does is some dark room stuff. So uh, this thing has a bunch of functions. I don't know. Maybe I'm going to unplug it just so I can hold it over. Uh, over by the camera here. Um, can you guys read the LCD screen? Yeah, yeah. and um, and this is a, a blue-green LCD screen that has two lines of, uh, of color yeah. for our, so, for our like, listeners. And, and we'll talk about why that is um, during like going through the prototyping process. But I was trying to make it as simple as possible, but also simple to use, right? So simple as possible. I could have done this entire thing with one single button, but then to use it, it would have been murder, right? I also could have put 15 buttons on it, which would have been reasonable, but also then to use it, you would have had to have like a long manual. Currently, like the manual for everything is like five pages for the scanner, five and a half pages, uh, although maybe I will make some diagrams. Anyway, um, this control box may get changed. I actually, when we get through the prototypes, we'll get to why this thing looks like it does. Uh, but I love that it looks like the original NES to me, uh, particularly <laughs> like a bunch of the covers in gray. Um, and that sort of is, I did not think like, I'm gonna make something that looks like an NES. I thought, let me figure out a strong and reasonable way to assemble a housing for the mechanical and electronic components that I had designed. Um, this thing is just an acrylic box, which, you know, I think it looks slick. The original uh, one I was going to ship was acrylic, and they sort of matched, but I might make a new housing for this. And that's, you know, it's not sort of like one of those questions like, oh, do I know how to make a 3D printed box that this goes in? Like, that's that's a solved problem. I just have not solved it in this case is yet. It, um, isn't there, um, I mean, I'm looking at that. That's just a box. Um, it looks like you've designed it. Does... yeah. Uh, isn't there an off-the-shelf that you could uh, yeah, source yeah. from China for a lot cheaper? So the faceplate um, is custom to a board that I designed. So it's got my own circuit board that looks you know, something like this plus mm -hmm. uh, components on it. Um, and so the faceplate needs to go there and like it's kind of an odd shape. And so it's actually not that expensive to laser cut a box. It's a little bit more expensive to 3D print or maybe even injection mold a box. Um, this may be what it winds up looking like. I'll probably ship the tester models with this control box. It probably won't change that much, but I've been thinking about 3D printing a control box that sort of like aesthetically more matches this. But, you know, again, I think scanners are not things people fetishize for what they look like, much like cameras, and they really care what they do a lot more. But um, Ethan, we're gonna have to we're, we're gonna have to work on uh, a mongoose logo, and you're gonna yeah. have to do some vinyl um, vinyl um, uh, sticker or something to go on each one of those d devices. Yeah, and I've been with them because... eating snakes and trying to sketch them with the snake turning into some film. I probably will need to FCC ID them with a laser etching, and so that might be a good time to you know. Uh -huh catch some uh, branding on it. But, you know, I I also like cleanliness. But anyway, suffice it to say, like, by the time this video comes out, this may be a very similar box to the one that I sell. It won't be exactly because um, the plugged in right now, this hole does not exactly fit. Okay.
marking where I need to do it. But I, I have one comment. Uh, I really like the colored buttons uh, because as an, as an old person, uh, I can't ever see the black on black with the tiny writing they put on most stereo systems. But there are colorblind people, so maybe some sort of braille addition to it yeah, would so be good. One of the things, I mean, the only, like, this is exactly as it's going to wind up shipping. This thing, um, you know, it'll have exactly these buttons and layouts. The electronics are finalized, but like, you know, this power switch might move somewhere or not. Um, the buttons may get like sub numbers or labels under them that are laser etched. Uh, but I refer to them in the manual as button one, two, three, and four. And like in different modes, different buttons do different things. And so, and I make like a little cheat sheet or something, but it's fairly simple to use. Um, so yeah, people, people can just put on stickers too. Yeah. The other thing I might change, which is electronically identical, but has a different uh, mask is this is currently a blue and white uh, LCD screen. I might make a red L LCD screen. Um, oh, for dark room situations. For secret, <laughs> secret uh, reasons. But so um, it's got these four buttons. This yellow button, the button one, cycles through the modes. Um, so let's see. Hard to do this in order. Um, so the first mode is manual mode, in which you can scroll the film like this. It's not connected. So so for the people at home, it says manual mode and then scroll speed colon one X. Right. And so as I turn the knob, it'll scroll forward and back. And if I push the knob, it'll change the scroll speed. One uh, X, two X, four X, eight X, 16, 32, and 64. And so that changes your scroll speed. So you can jog through a lot of film and then also precisely align. And then in manual mode, this red button, uh, button two, will um, fire the camera, which again is not connected. Oh, oh <laughs> end of roll, exclamation. Oh, I, across I, there. I hit the yellow button, which took me into fast mode. Um, it detects the end of the roll and it stops mm -hmm. part of what I did with the edge detection. Uh, I haven't decided whether or not to make it eject afterwards, but I kind of like leaving it in if you want to go back. But maybe I'll make that a feature. Anyway. Um, Fast mode, again, you can scroll back and forth and jog the film. You can press the button to change the jog speed, and you can uh, press the start button, which will uh, start the process until it reaches the end of the film. Also, you can press these two buttons in. I'm not going to do it because I've calibrated it. And that was the uh, green and the blue? Right, buttons three and four. And then you can measure a set number of frames, which you can adjust. Uh, press an in and an out, and then it will measure what the frame spacing is between your roll of film, which if you're always using one camera with one set of frame spacing, you'll only have to do that once. But if you want to change it for a different frame spacing, like the Bronco pan, for example, has huge frame spacing, um, you could set that. Um, and that's pretty simple to do. The next is automatic mode. Um, <clears throat> and basically, the only function there is you press, uh, well, again, you can jog back and forth to load the film and change the jog speed and you press start and it will you know do a calibration alignment and uh, picture now, it has on the second line frm zero and that's just frame number yeah that's a frame count so when you start okay. every every frame it'll count and tell you how many frames it's okay and we'll do the same in uh auto in fast mode and okay. then <clears throat> again i'm not going to do this because i have already calibrated it but um, if you press these two buttons together, it will... Okay. The green and the yellow. Yeah. Uh, sorry, the green, green and blue. Three and four. Um, it will do a calibration cycle and find one edge. And then you can align where you want the frame to be after it's found the edge. Because the edge is found while it's inside of the scanner. The edge is not in the film gate. Um, and you could align that frame anywhere within the film gate. I can't find the edge while it's in the film gate because I need a sensor on the front and back to find the edge. Anyway, okay. you can set that alignment for anything. There'll be some tips and tricks in the manual about how to actually use that uh, alignment to speed up the scanning process. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and then after that, so there's those three scanning modes is uh, manual, fast, and automatic. And then it has um, a bunch of settings modes. So the first setting mode here is fast frame count. And so you can push this button in and change the number of frames that 
you have to measure to uh, set the fast mode. So in fast mode, you can measure one frame's uh, frame distance, right? Or you can measure two. You can actually measure up to 38 frames to set uh, to set how uh, how far the frames are apart. And so if I measure 38 frames, it might take me a minute, right? But if I'm always going to be shooting uh, Nikon F3 film, it might be worth my time to measure 38 frames once and get a really precise measurement. That being said, I find three to five frames pretty much does it perfectly every time. I've never had to go that far, but I thought I'd you know give give the option of a larger variable there. Um, currently, uh, what you saw earlier, I think, was uh, you know precise, and I had only measured three frames. Um, the next setting is calibrate stop. So basically, here you just press the button once while there's no film in the scanner. And it will just cal you basically have to do this one time when you buy the scanner, right? But then it calibrates uh, what uh, what it looks like through the sensors when there's no film in it. So it can say, "Hey, I have no film," and stop what it's doing. Um, then it has a trigger interval, and this uh, basically it tells the computer how long to trigger the camera for. So like. If I just connect the contacts to fire my A7 for one microsecond, uh, it actually won't trigger the camera. And so I'm triggering the camera for 90 milliseconds. Um, it's a little less than a tenth of a second to get one picture. I could actually trigger it for so long. I can trigger it up to a second, which will take like two or three pictures on the Sony, which you don't want. So anyway, to set that, you just push this button in and turn it and you figure out how to do it. You know, just set those, set that back to 90 backwards, push that in. It makes a little beep to tell me that it has uh, saved that info. Also, all of these settings save to internal memory inside of the camera, or it's inside of the control box, so that you only have to set them once, not every time you turn the machine on. Then you have uh, the frame delay. So if you are shooting through a very small aperture or have a dim light or very low ISO, and let's say you're taking the picture for an entire second, this is the pause while um, you are taking a picture um, so that you're not scrolling film while the camera shutter is still open. And you can set that up to two seconds. Um, then you've got uh, edge detect sensitivity, and that's for the automatic mode. You can set that from zero to 100, and that determines how likely it is to find the edge. But pretty much I have this set somewhere between 28 and 70 always. And usually if I leave it on 38, it'll do like 99.9% .9 of everything I scan. Um, and then negative positive mode. This is the Mike Gutterman mode. Um, you have to tell it. It doesn't auto detect whether it's scanning negatives or positives. So if you're shooting slides, it's looking for a dark strip uh, for an edge, and this is only does it also does it also drink whiskey at the same time? Is that uh, you should not put whiskey on this? It's whiskey not in a water film camera. <laughs> um, <clears throat> yeah, so this is only relevant for the automatic uh, mode, uh, but you tell it whether it's looking at negatives or positives, and if it's doing negatives, it'll do colors or uh, black and white, no problem. And then you can turn the sound on or off. Um, which is useful. And the, the beeps basically beep every time you save a setting to memory or uh, at the end of a row, it's a couple of times. And we're back on manual mode. That's all of the modes of the Mongoose scanner control box. And yeah, I think that's, uh, I, I didn't want to give you like the full manual, but I want to give you an idea of like all of the things it did before we get into uh, the, the prototypes and such. I think that thing looks fantastic. I really like it. Um, I think so. it yeah. Okay, so Ethan, uh, I noticed that you had a big pile of uh, 
of prototypes that you went through to arrive at this final decision. And that's that's how design works. You make things, they don't quite work out. You make an improved version. It goes on and on. And since you make things from scratch, that you can sort of pull these things out of thin air. And I mean, there's an expense, but at least you're doing the manufacturing. I often do a lot of work where I'm working with old parts and cameras, and I can't afford to keep cutting them up and, and being wrong. So um, what I've done is I've accumulated years and years of mistakes, and then I try and uh, recreate all of that on paper before I get the saw out and hack into a, a, an old camera. Um, it's so, you, to some extent, you can kind of channel past failure to get quicker to where you're going, but when you're making something this complicated, obviously you have to keep trying uh, to get there. So how many tries did it take for you to get to this? Um, so it, it depends, I guess, where you draw the line between a try. So right here I have one, two, five prototypes um, on this desk before I got to the one that, that's ready. Um, each one of those has, you know, three to five iterations that, you know, each prototype here sort of represents an idea. Um, and some of them were not like, okay, so <clears throat> a lot of times people will like uh, show like an inspirational picture where it's like, uh, people think it's the road from like where you are to success and it's a straight line. But in fact, it's a zigzaggy line with failures at each one, you know, like that sort of inspirational poster. But in fact, um, those fail, like this project has just been a long string of failures with incremental successes, but like those failures are a necessary part of the design process. And a lot of these prototypes were never designed to be a scanner. Um, it started out as an idea of a scanner, but each prototype for the first three were basically just testing one component of a scanner. And even if that component worked, which eventually they got to work they never would work as a scanner because it just tested, you know, uh, an edge detection protocol, or it just tested, um, you know, connectivity through ethernet cords, or it just tested uh, motors. And so we'll take a look at that. Um, it's, it's been kind of like an interesting thing, like the standard sort of uh, electronicist or electrical engineer programmer method of doing this is like, you build something on a pin board, which is sort of like a removable, uh, you change pins and positions, and then you get everything to work sort of well enough that you can uh, control or read each of the modules or components, and then you solder everything up so that um, all of your pins aren't wiggly while you're programming for a month, and then you program as far as you can go, and then you have to start you know, cutting wires and soldering other things and then finally you get something you know that kind of uh works but it's a big snarl of wires and then you turn it into like a printed circuit board and you have that made in china and then like then only at that point you know you're three months in and it starts becoming something that you're trying to make a scanner right but until then we were making weird prototypes so let me let me start off i'm going to screen share some of um the initial drawings. So um, I talked to M about this thing and that day uh, I, let's see, sorry, I'm just trying to slash up. Okay, um, this was my initial concept for <clears throat> the scanner, right? So oops. Um, you have, like a film gate, a sprocket wheel, a display, a couple of buttons, a uh, <clears throat> rotary encoder or a knob. And then I had this NEMA 17, which is the motor I was using at the time. It's a motor that, you know, turns the sprocket wheels. And then, uh, you know, some relays that triggered a camera or a strobe. And then I drew this cutaway down here. Um, and that was uh, kind of, isometric view of what I was trying to make. And then I was kind of thinking about how I might manufacture it out of laser cut parts that could be flat cut. Um, and I did a couple more drawings of, you know, what the film gate might look like. Um, and then 
you know, how you might space uh, the two film gates. And again, this is like day one and day two of this project four or five months ago. Um, and then I was thinking about mounting a camera directly to it, which eventually Em convinced me not to do, which I think was a good decision. And I made some uh, brief electrical schematics of like the first thing. And then um, that took me to my first prototype, right? And again, this prototype was not supposed to be <clears throat> a, um, not supposed to be a scanner, but basically, we, you know, electronics, we'd call it a test bed or a test bench. And so all I was trying to do here is one, make sure I could control a motor, which I knew I could from other projects, and two, um, use the ports that are under this tape to control a bunch of sensors and see what readings I could take as I scrolled film through this gate um, to see if I could notice from sensors and digital information what was film base and what was a negative. <clears throat> and so it took me about two days to make this. This is the second or third version. I got a box of parts of actually each one of these that did not work, but like this thing, you know, the film kind of slips here and there. It can wobble around like up and down. And it's it was never designed to be the final scanner. I knew that I would redesign all of the mechanical parts, but it was a prototype that took, you know, a couple of days for the sole purpose of testing uh, these sensors in here. And at that point, I had this thing hooked up to um, kind of this guy, which this is again, you know, the 12th iteration of a circuit that I had. And, and he's he's showing this uh, picture of a, of a knob and uh, spaghetti in yeah. green and yellow and red and orange and and pink and black. Uh, there, it's just a pin board with a bunch of different stuff in it. Right, and so um, this is called like a solderless breadboard or a proto board or a pin board or breadboard. It's basically um, a board with uh, electrical connections on the inside and uh, holes that you can um, stick things into, like that rotary encoder or a few buttons or wires. And what it allows you to do is really quickly plug a circuit in. Um, and this is like a real jumble. Uh, it's been messed with you know, many, many times. Um, and this thing sort of changes as I go along. But like, this was the point at which I had, you know, a microcontroller and a screen and a relay and like all of the components that I knew I would need to run this thing. Um, and they were working and like, it's really annoying to program on this for months, because one, it's kind of hard to trace the wires, although you've defined where the wires go, and you don't need to but two, um, these pin boards are wiggly little bastards. And if you just bump it, you know, the, you lose a connection and then you're looking through a program that's thousands of lines of code for an error that's actually like this pin has popped out over here. So um, <laughs> I spent a couple of weeks working like this. Uh, okay, I'm gonna say at this point, I'm out. What? What do you mean? I, I'm out. I'm out. I'm not do. I'm not continuing it at that point. I'm just get. I'm going. Ah, I, I'm going to do something else. <laughs> yeah, I have a little bit of um, you know, like sort of Aspergersy focus, which can be helpful uh, for things like this. But you know, I could bathe more for sure. <laughs> um, I don't think you want to take that thing in the shower. No, definitely nothing about this is waterproof, but it's durable. Um, anyway, once. No, and it looks super useful. It's basically a way to speed up your mistake making. Exactly. Um, yeah. Exactly. And so um, once I had this, you know, not to the point where I had a program that would run the scanner, but I had this to the point where, you know, I could send a control to move a motor. I could read the rotary encoder and the buttons. I could send some uh, data to the screen. I could turn the relay on and off. Then it was time to solder up like a hard board, right? And so again, this board that I made, um, this is the third iteration of it. This is all hand soldered. It's actually um, a bunch of different boards that stack up. And again, the the final scanner was never supposed to be this or look like this. This was just a way to test an equ electronically equivalent circuit to what I wanted to build um, in a way that I didn't have to send it to China and wait 
for a week for it to come back and pay to make a run of them. I just needed one that, you know, the, the connections wouldn't be loose. So then I could write the program. And so I actually just started with this top board connected to the microcontroller and realized I didn't break out enough of the outputs for some of the other things I wanted to do. So then I had to make spend a day and make this middle board, uh, take the top board off, make the middle board connect to the microcontroller, break some things out over here, and then stick this top board on. Minutia of building electronics, but basically for a long time, months, this was my scanner, right? And this scanner uh, just connected again to this test bed here. And the idea was like, test bed is mechanically simple, right? I know I can make a film advance mechanism. I did one on the Bronco pan and plenty of other people made them. What I didn't know was, you know, could I read these sensors uh, reliably? And could I write a protocol that, you know, would allow a user with four buttons and a knob and an LCD screen go through and set all of the things that they needed to set? And uh, could I have them connect? And so I spent kind of months fiddling with uh, this thing. And then eventually uh, it got to the point where um, I had written 7,000 lines of code and all sorts of sub menus and, uh, you know, matrices and things to actually run this thing. So once, once I had this guy, um, let me see what other diagrams I have. Um, here we go. Screen share. Um, uh, one second. Okay, so once I had that guy, then I went to like, this is now similar to the circuit that I'm actually using. It became much more complex and led me to buy a lot of colored pencils to trace lines. Um, so stop sharing. Um, then I took that and let's see. I like seeing all these pencil drawings that that's, uh, I think, it just I can connect better with that than mm -hmm. than uh, you know the the CAD yeah, I, stuff. I will also say that uh, Ethan, your dream camera journal is my nightmare camera journal. What do you, what do you mean? <laughs> just uh, the the whole idea of all those lines of the circuit board and all that type of stuff. I know you're working through a process. Yeah. My problem is that that it, it's like a fever dream of 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 a process for my brain. Yeah. Okay, so then that became this. So I took that uh, schematic or the next schematic, I don't remember which version I just showed, but um, that schematic then uh, was associated with actual footprints of components and laid out on a board. And I traced all of these circuit traces uh, between different pads and pins. Um, and then, you know, this is the main control board with like a shadow of where the screen would go. And then I have some of the sensor modules. And so these, again, I'm not sure exactly which versions these were, but these went through five or six versions. Um, and what Ethan is showing right now uh, for the listeners, right? Uh, there uh, are, is this a, um, a computer program that yeah, so this is, is, a, is for uh, designing circuit boards? This is a free open, well, this is just a screenshot that I prepared last yeah. night. Yeah, yeah. Uh, here's a screenshot of KiCad or KiCad, K I C A D, which is a circuit board or PCB drafting software, uh, which allows you to basically draft uh, circuit boards and then send them to wherever some uh, fab to be made. Um, and so I, I have drafted over 10 circuit boards at this point. Um, and yeah, the, this set makes use of a bunch of them. <laughs> uh, and it's it's something I really kind of like is that it really makes it clear that a circuit board or an electronic device is in fact a drawing. It's a bunch of lines and switches that connect different parts, and yeah. it Absolutely. really is at, at, at base a drawing. Right. And so you know that first circuit board I made was uh, this one, um, and so I sent that off to China, and it came in a week later, and had a bunch of connections. I made a bunch of errors on this, which were just stupid novice errors. Like I put some of, and, and I had made these errors years ago doing this professionally and just like, 
I don't know. I don't know why I continued to make them, but like um, I assumed that these uh, RJ45 connectors, the, the Ethernet connectors, were symmetrical, even though I could see plainly that they weren't. And so I put them on the wrong side of the board, and the holes for the uh, microcontroller were spaced incorrectly. And so <clears throat> what I wound up was this board, which was, again, my test board for a while, which would fit in no case reasonably and had to have, uh, you know, the screen hanging off. And uh, this is like a really dangly power switch. And then, you know, the microcontroller did not fit. So I had to use this ridiculous ribbon cable. But this, oh, and I also uh, swapped the connections for the camera trigger, so I needed to break those out and not use the camera trigger on this board, but use the camera trigger hand soldered on this board. And so I used this for a couple of weeks while I redesigned a new board. Uh, and, and I'd like to comment that Ethan is showing us robot guts. He has a handful of robot guts. <laughs> yeah. So um, then, you know, I'll show you some of the boards that I designed. This is um, the current board for the control box, which connects everything really and then uh, these were some early sensor modules um, the earlier prototypes had like an upper and lower sensor and a main control board or a motherboard for the scanner module um, this wound up not being used at all uh, this is a control board for like a more secret thing that will come later um, <clears throat> this is part of an integrated. So, is, is that secret thing that's what's going to launch the rocket, or oh, <laughs> we might need to edit that out? Yeah, no, uh, they all are very small little things. But um, this is part of the the sensor module for the current scanner, and then uh, this is another secret board. Anyway, I made a bunch okay. of boards. Um, oh. Another guess on the secret is if you scan a picture of a waterfall, does it shock you? Because, you know, waterfalls are passe and nobody should ever take a picture of a waterfall. Interesting you should mention that. One of the secret functions has to do with taking pictures of falling water. Um, okay. Yeah. Wonderful. Wonderful. I'm, I'm in. I'm in. Okay. <clears throat> I don't want to advertise those just yet, but um, let's see if I can pull up some more things. So. Eventually, I kind of got to the point where <clears throat> I had, you know, this control board was working. I was, you know, I had ordered this thing. Um, I designed the main control board around the electronics and then designed the case around the board, right, which is pretty standard for control boxes. But for the scanner, I, in fact, designed the scanner and then um, designed sort of the sensor in a regular CAD program in SOLIDWORKS, then exported that shape into CAD and then designed the sensor around the physical uh, dimensions of the scanner. And so um, at that point, let's see, I can do some more drawings. Yeah, here we go. Uh, sorry, looking for my screen share. I got to say, at this point, I have to say that I'm really disappointed that, that what you showed us uh, early on would, did not just spring forth whole in whole cloth from right. from your brain uh, through the through the 3D printer I mean, and the laser cutter. What would we, what would we <laughs> talk about, right? It would be whatever. Um, so <laughs> at, the, at the point that I had it working, now I needed to design a scanner, right? Now I needed to actually figure out how I could take all of those pieces and put them together and make the mechanics of it reliable and put it in a housing so I didn't have, you know, I can't sell people a uh, pile of wires and a pin board and tell them if it stops working, start wiggling L3, you know? And so I just started doing like a little bit of sort of basic industrial design cartooning, which is like, okay, I know the shape of the things I'm working with. What is the shape of the, the housing? And so, you know, this was from months ago, but I kind of settled on a shape kind of like this. Um, and then here's an example of like, I just took a lot of the components from the original control board and I traced them in different colors into my notebook, um, scale one to one. And then I could measure them to draw a box around them and then 
here I'm kind of thinking about how that control box might fit together in an exploded isometric view. Um, so they, oh, here's 14 pages of uh, the manual that I wrote. Um, here I'm uh, tracing components so that I can get them into CAD uh, precisely so that they mate to the control box. And then I started thinking that I would laser cut um, the scanner as much as I could instead of 3D printing it uh, because it's much quicker. Um, and so this was an idea that I had for uh, an exploded view of some of the panels that would go together to create um, a to create a uh, scanner. And then here's some ideas for making like a rotating spindle out of primarily laser cut parts with some 3D printed ends. This was actually like my most clever drawing, which looks like much, not much, but um, this is sort of the pattern that I came up with for creating intricate spacing between the upper and lower film gates, uh, where, you know, these holes you see on the sides. Do you see my cursor? Yeah, so we're looking at a, uh, oh, we're looking at it. It looks like a rectangle with a little rectangle scattered around on it. Yeah, and, and so the film would enter through this hole and the upper gate would be here with like little box joints that goes through the side and then the lower gate would be here. And the cleverness of this is that box joints are never touching each other. And so that these could be spaced like half a millimeter apart uh, to make a nice tight film gate, which ultimately was the downfall of this prototype that I made from it. But um, you know, we'll get to that in, in physical things. Um, so, by, so by box joint, you a cabinet maker would call that a, a, a mortise and tenon. Joint. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Right. Um, this is a sketch that I realized my rotary encoders look a lot like bacteriophages. Um, let's see what we have here. <laughs> Look, uh, they look like viruses too, actually. Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. That's, that's definitely the bug in the machine, right? Yes. Yeah. Well, yeah, I had some bugs yesterday having to do with the rotary encoder, which I fixed. Okay. So um, basically, that led me to designing uh, uh, this thing, which was a very close finished prototype. So at that point, you know, I had made this laser cutter control box um, that we were looking at today, which I might make some uh, modifications to. Uh, certainly I'll fix, you know, how these ports align. Um, but this was, oops, an entirely laser cut uh, board. And some of the cuts were not perfect. And so I had to, instead of having an RJ45 port here, I had to uh, just glue an old circuit board on the inside and deal with it like that, but good enough for prototyping the mechanism, right? Because at this point I had written 7,000 lines of code. I had designed some sensors and it was ready to go, but you know, uh, <clears throat> this was not going to cut it, <laughs> you know, and it, it needed to be clean. Another thing that I did was I designed these, um, RJ 45 to, uh, JST connector adapters and soldered up a bunch of these so that I could try um, sending power and signal over these Cat5 cables just to make everything really clean. I didn't want any external cabling that was multi-stranded, um, like you know this sort of garbage here. I wanted a clean wrap thing. Anyway, I made this guy, and it he wants his wants to hide the guts, basically. Exactly. I want to hide the guts. And I want anything to, that's outside, like, to be very durable and clean and sort of, like, not only not ugly, but just, like, not going to get chopped, right? I want this to last for a very long time. I think one of the cool things about it is it gets to be, like, a forever scanner where, you know, you update your camera. Like, there's no need to update this thing. It's not going to get any faster than 40 seconds. Um, so... This thing, I don't know if you can see in here, um, it's got, it's very hard to see, it's all black. Um, I'm, for those at home, showing a black, shiny acrylic box, but, you know, it's got, um, here, if I pull this side off, it's got a motor and some sensors over here and a control board, um, and then... It's full of robot yeah, guts. Yeah, full of robot guts. 
And then it's got that sprocket wheel and an upper and lower film gate. And this one worked pretty darn well. Um, and I thought, okay, I'm, I'm ready. This is gonna be my scanner. In fact, I think, uh, give me one second. I have some videos of this thing working. There we go. Let's see if I can screen share a video. This might turn out poorly, but try. So this is a video of it working, you know, maybe more than a month ago now. And again, for those folks at home, uh, this is um, very close to what we were seeing at the beginning uh, of the of the podcast, uh, where the film's moving back and forth through that film gate. Yeah, and so at that point, it's it's basically the same device that I showed you, but it's in a different mechanical housing. Um, and eventually, you know, I fixed that board. So. so so what's wrong with this mechanical housing? It's a different shape from the one. This it kind of reminds me of a motorcycle battery. So those yeah. of you, uh, you know, it's about the size and shape um, of a motorcycle battery, hopefully a little bit lighter. Yeah. Um, so what was it that didn't work? What was not satisfactory about this? Right. So this one had a couple of issues just with the way it was cut that led me to have um, this cord hanging out and the board soldered in here, which I knew I could fix. I just needed to sh change the shape of one of the boards so it could fit, right? And so this worked for a good while. And I thought like, okay, this is working great. Um, the next one where I fix this board issue where you know I put the plug right here is gonna do it. That'll be my final prototype. I'm ready to release this thing, it works great. And so I made this one, which worked amazingly. Um, I changed a bunch of tolerances. It doesn't have the back plate on it or some of the motor wires, but um, this guy worked excellently. And it's basically exactly the same thing with just a few little uh, tolerance changes, not around the actual mechanism. And so I used this for a while and then I was like, okay, I'm ready to send out reviewer models. Um, and I spent 14 hours uh, laser cutting 10 units, which was longer than I thought. And then the next day I got to put them all together. I solder everything up, the boards go together, great. And then I start assembling them and I realized that, you know, these two that I built that look like this worked phenomenally. However, not all the laser cuts were perfect and it was relying on these film gates being exactly 0.5 millimeters apart. And so if the laser cut was, um, if it didn't have enough tolerance, I couldn't fit the parts together. And if it had too much tolerance, then these film gates would not be held in the right spot to hold the film flat and also let it pass smoothly. So and tell us a, tell us a little bit about laser cutting versus 3D printing because I think that um, those of you who have been following uh, Hamish Gill's Pixelator uh, project, he had a whole lot of problems with the diffusers and the cutting on that and that they weren't being cut in the exact same location. So what's up with that? I thought that, uh, you know, it's yeah. laser beams. So well, okay. why are they not perfect? I, I could have made that. I don't, I'm, I'm not talking smack about Hamish. I'm really into Hamish's product. I think what he's done is brilliant, but I, I wish we were friends way back when and we talked laser cutting. I think we could have designed that product for laser cutting. 
Um, the way a laser cutter works, there's a lot of different ways a laser cutter works, but the way a large CO2 laser like I'm using works is it has, you know, a three or four foot laser tube and that tube shines on a mirror. And then you have a CNC axis with a gantry that moves it around. So the gantry moves forward and back and a laser head moves left and right on that gantry, just like a 3D printer. And so the beam um, shoots out of the laser tube, hits a 45 degree mirror, and then riding on the gantry, there's another 45 degree mirror that redirects the beam over to the head, which has another 45 degree mirror pointing down. And as the head moves back and forth, that beam is shined through um, a lens or a laser nozzle with some other uh, air handling on it. And then that, <clears throat> that cuts uh, the, the acrylic or wood or whatever you're cutting. And so there's a lot of points of failure uh, within it, just like 3D printing, which is your gantry can be crooked, your beam can be out of focus or not aligned. And so you're not always getting exactly precise cuts if, if everything is not working correctly. And I don't have my own laser cutter and there's a lot of jamokes using that laser cutter and like leaning on it and kind of, it is not always 100% reliable, which is one of the reasons why I'm gonna buy a laser cutter. Um, and so, yeah, the, the issue was, is I am sure that I could get and keep a laser cutter dialed in that only I use, uh, and I will. But what was happening is on this laser cut set of prototypes is a lot of the parts were not fitting together because I made the tolerances very, very tight. Uh, because um, the film gates, I wish I brought in a film gate, I had a lot of them, but um, there's two plates um, that the film passes through, right? So you have one plate and then the film on top and another plate and that holds the film so it moves through some rails and it's only touched outside of the images so it doesn't scratch it. Um, but that needs to be a very precise tolerance. And because of the way that laser cutters really only cut flat objects, I didn't build in adjustments for that tolerance. And so um, I would have either had to lose that, that precision by cutting everything oversized uh, or the holes oversized and the plugs undersized or um, I would have had to spend forever which is what I was doing like precisely cutting with an exacto and making sure everything fit together perfect and so I built like two or three of these and it took me all day and I thought this you know I could I could get the tester units out like this that would look you know just like this model um, but if I had to make 20 of them, let alone 100, uh, it would be absolute murder in assembly. I'm I, I'm going to throw you another curve on that. Um, what you're building this out of shiny? What is it? Acrylic, shiny yep. black acrylic. One of the things that I'm thinking about is that area on either side of the uh, of the film gate. And I'm thinking about light reflections and and all a uh, bunch of stuff with that. Could you do this out of uh, three millimeter plywood? That would solve a little bit of the tolerance issue because you know you can sand and you can you know plywood. You know, yeah. could could you do that? Then you could varnish them and make them beautiful pieces of furniture around your house yeah well so it, it occurred to me i do a lot of laser cutting out of plywood um there's issues with flatness and smoothness and then post finishing by hand that you deal with wood that would also make it murder right i can sand acrylic and i can you know trim so it fits perfectly it's a little harder than wood uh, the other thing is like sort of dust collection and smoothnessity um it, it just like it didn't have an adjustable film gate, which I really disliked. And um, yeah, the plywood would only get me so far out of those problems. And I don't think it would look, you know, I'm not really into looks, but I don't think it would look professional in the same way that the Nintendo Entertainment System version does. Mm -hmm. um, and also, like, I know a lot about 3D printing. Like, if it takes a long time to print, I'll buy 10 more printers. They're cheap. Um, and I can keep those running in my house uh well but like the most important thing that i did was i added a film gate adjustment and so <clears throat> there's a lot of slop built into each one of the parts um in this version that we looked at before but um that slop does not mean slop in assembly right like everything 
can be adjusted within a tenth of a millimeter that's important uh, with screws. And so being able to make a three-dimensional part instead of a series of two-dimensional parts, it's it just made assembly really easy and foolproof to make a precise instrument. And so um, I hated doing this because <clears throat> as soon as I had, you know, this first one working on my desk, I started making calls like a monkey to all of the podcasts and, uh, you know, uh, media outlets. And I was like, okay, I'm going to launch this thing in a week. I'm ready. You know, I know I have to call uh, ahead of time. You know, nobody can fit me in. That you're, you're, you're talking about ramping up to your tartness. Yeah, exactly. I, I started about thinking about pod tartan around so I could launch a Kickstarter because time is money and I can't waste months fiddling around. But also, I didn't want to send reviewers prototypes that don't look like the actual object uh, because that's going to disappoint a lot of people. Or in this case, I think you know, the actual object came out a lot better and they would like it, but that would mean a lot of people wouldn't. You know, I just, I, I want the thing as it's going to go out the door before I start advertising, right? I'm, I'm not into that BS Kickstarter advertising for something that doesn't exist or for something that is going to show up and be like the, uh, what was that digital Yashica Digifilm thing? So anyway, I sucked it up and I took another week and a half and I started making some drawings of a, um, oops, share a window here. I started making drawings of um, a 3D printed version that's, you know, a final version rather than um, that original 3D printed test bed. And so I drew some things here. Um, <clears throat> basically, you know, I have in this area of the screen is actually, I got a better drawing of it here. Um, so in this area is the main body. And then I have a upper film gate. The main body has the lower film gate integrated into it. And, and then, again, he's, he's showing some isometric drawings from a sketchbook. Yeah. And these were the last drawings that I made by hand before this current Nintendo Entertainment System version of the Mongoose. Um, and so I did a couple really cool things in here. One, you know, it's got this dust cover that covers the electronics, so it's nice and durable and doesn't look ugly. Um, it has this sliding door, so um, there's a little gray piece on this prototype. It'll probably be black eventually, where you can open it up and dust inside of everything and then keep it closed as a dust cover. So, like, there's nothing you can't get to if this thing gets dirty or dusty. Which is a huge problem with like you got an Epson, you got to get out the screwdrivers in the clean room to clean it. But this you can just dust with an air duster. Um, mm -hmm. So that door was a cool innovation. Um, it's got the the two biggest things is one, it's got some holes on the top of the upper film gate that allow me to adjust the tension of the upper and lower film gate so I can get that perfect on every one so that the film will be smooth. And then, so that'll be something that you do before it leaves the uh, cambrodactyl factory. Yeah, that happens in assembly. That's actually the very first step of assembly after the parts are you know, cleaned is that that is adjusted with some shims. Um, I use the shims to adjust it. I remove the shims once they're done. They don't live in the item. Um, and then the other thing that I, because I was going to 3D printing over laser cutting and I had thought of ways to do this in laser cutting, but it was very complicated for assembly, but now I could do and I could do perfectly is before it relied on the rails that the sprockets rode on squeezing very tightly on the film and then the sprocket wheels pushing the film down to hold it relatively flat. And it did a pretty good job. But now that I could create three dimensional shapes, um, I don't know if you guys can see down here, um, I created a bi-curved film rail um, so that the film comes in flat and then it has to go up and then over and then down and over. And what that does is like film kind of works like a, a slap bracelet. It's a bi-stable object, which means it loves to curl in one direction, uh, like around a roll, in which case it does not curl at all. Um, Cup, you know, what we, what we call cupping, right? Exactly. But when you roll it out flat, it loves to cup 
which is no good. And so mm -hmm. here, one, I can get the film gate really tight uh, so that it can't cup that much. And the other thing is by putting a bend right before and after the film gate, um, it prevents that cupping because it's it's being bent in the opposite direction. And so, so it's uh, uh, for also for our listeners at home uh, who are aware of, of auto racing, it's like a chicane in the middle of the process. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, for uh, chicane is designed to slow people uh, slow down uh, the the cars and and you know to keep them from hitting max speed. This just changes the direction of the uh the the bend in the film mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. by basically uh by making a, an abrupt turn one way and then the other way it uh it cancels out the tendency for the film to want to curl uh, mm -hmm. it's it's uh it's hard to describe but uh, it, it's well worth seeing the picture but it's making a sharp bend and i see that um in some roll film holders that use a roller um to change the direction of the film right before it gets to the gate and that helps flatten yeah. it out a lot too yeah and that's you know it's not something that i invented it's uh it's like a common practice amongst many film holders not all do it uh but film holders roll film backs um negative or, or or just the film gate in a camera one of the things about a yeah. film gate in a camera is it usually bends just before it gets to the film gate and then bends right after the film gate in you know to make a a u shape or an n shape depending on your point of view exactly and so you know i think that's uh pretty useful and the, <clears throat> the deal is is like i'm using rails um you know to hold by the sprockets i'm not using a pressure plate because um outside of the rails the the gates are actually far away from the film so even if it is cupped coming in or going out if you've got some really bent film it can't touch anywhere where there's image so it can't scratch which was like if i'm scratching people's film it's a no-go right and so that was like a very important thing to me well, even wait that's that's a feature not a bug yeah <laughs> yeah so uh so you have you have to pay extra for the optional scratcher it, it's it's the lomo version right yeah that's the co-branded lomo camera dactyl version no no uh, <laughs> no. Different style. Um, so these are some uh, drawings. They're not renderings. They're just pictures from SolidWorks. I took some screen shares last night to show you guys. Um, but here is a cross section. Actually, I'll show you that this is uh, very close to the final object. Obviously, like I've made some things transparent or translucent and uh, different colors just so I could see individual parts. But you know, this is kind of what I spent. Uh, the last couple of weeks doing when I had to throw away my perfectly functioning prototype, but not mass assemblable prototype. And so I made this guy. I, I want you to go back to that film uh, because he showed, uh, he was showing the three, three dimensional version uh, or the 3d modeling version of that uh, little chicane. Uh, mm -hmm. Can you go back to that? Yeah, yeah. I just wanted to show you like where okay. we're looking first before we look at the cross section. So okay. I mean, cross section here and you can see that um in green here we're looking at the film gate um, uh -huh. and in orange we're looking at the body or the lower part of the film gate and so you can see that the film comes in goes up here and then where this cut is um, and it's a darker green that's the film gate um, and then passes flat through the gate and then is pushed uh down and uh and, I, and I'm going to say um, with this, for people who are listening, this is um, you look at look at the time code right now on your podcast, and you might want to go to the YouTube video just for this, um, because yeah. this to me is is really fascinating because it I think that this could be something that uh, for camera builders, this can be a way to get your film flat in, that is, you, you know, not just for people who are going to, you know, steal Ethan's idea and No, go. it's not my idea. I stole it from... No, <laughs> no, no, no. Well, I'm saying, yeah, st steal the mongoose concept and, and make your own, uh, which we fully support. I fully support. I'm going to back you up. Um, 
<laughs> Ethan can't Ethan can't get to me and hit me from here. No, but no. Um, but this this visually is uh, is something that's really important, and I come I'm kind of seeing it as build this in consciously if you're working with 35 millimeter or, or and, and you're working with roll film. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, one thing I do notice also about the schematic is the distance of the sprockets from the film gate. Right. So, so, so I just want to point out here what's, yeah. uh, what's light blue and light orange on the sides. That's actually the center where it's not touching the film at all. Um, where the gate is, let's see if I can zoom in here. Um, the gate is a little obstructed by these blue lines. I should have deleted them. The gate is actually this very thin piece going through here, right? And so it's always 0.5 millimeters or less apart. Um, and okay. so, you know, it's not like the film goes up here. Where it's just sort right. of that rendering works, but it's so it's not the distance from the the brown to the green. It's it's something yeah. like it's a it's tighter, a tiny little line yeah. in the middle here uh, is kind of how that film gate looks. These big swooping curves have more to do with like sensors and. Um, okay, so so let me ask that question that I was just asking is oh, that's why I was answering is is okay. so. This is the edge of the sprocket, so we can see the sprocket wheel here. And yeah. this actually, um, you know, I had 27 original sprocket tests and a few in this version too, where, <clears throat> you know, I'm making sure that the radius of the sprocket inside of each one of the little fingers, um, each one of the cogs is not pushing the film down, you know, into and breaking it on the lower film gate but it's riding right above uh, this film gate. And then um, it's using these fingers that penetrate through beyond where the film can be depressed to. So it must grab and grab smoothly. Okay. I'm using a different version of the term film gate for my question. What I'm asking is the opening where we can see the frame right. versus... Um, so... One of the things that you're going to want to do on this, uh, okay, so I'm thinking of this. I'm thinking of uh, those cameras that have auto advance. You put in a 36 exposure roll, it gets you 37, uh -huh. right? So um, if, if you have that, then, you know, usually when I cut the film, um, when I'm loading it into, you know, onto a reel, I'm actually cutting through that either the first or the last frame, depending on how your camera works. But uh, the one that is at the end of the, of the sprocket or at the end of the, uh, of the roll of film. So when you're, when you've developed your film, you're going to want to make sure that when you're, you know, like when you trim off the leader, you're going to want to not trim a whole bunch of it because you might exclude your first frame. Am I, Am I right on that? Or is that? Yeah. So um, it is, we were saying before, like if you have pre-cut negatives, it'll work, but it's not the best tool for it, right? It's not saving you that much speed. It's really like, you know, uncut negatives are the best. If you leave on a long leader uh, to feed in, it really helps. Actually, this is the first version where like all of the previous versions, you needed to cut a perfect edge. This thing, like so long as your sprockets aren't like bent and, you know, crinkled, like you can feed it just about any edge and it'll grab and move smoothly. Um, but you may need to manually photograph the first frame or the last frame. Okay. It could be aligned. You know. uh, if you have a long leader, it'll just do the whole thing. Uh, if you have a short leader, you might have to, you know, manually shoot the first frame or two. Okay. Okay, so that's something to, to think of, you know, um, uh, put that in the manual, uh, warning, <laughs> um, because otherwise, you know, and also there are, you know, people are going to go back, you get one of these, they're going to go back through and maybe um, rescan some old negatives um, with this, you know, where they're cut, you know, they're cut into strips of five or six or seven, depending on their negative sleeves. I mean, plug for the pixelator. If you have cut film like that, um, uh -huh. I'd love to sell you one of these. 
give me a million dollars. But uh -huh. so the pixelator is like, I don't know, 40 bucks and yeah, perfect for that, right? Because if you're going to have to put in every, you know, four frames and align the first one, okay, it's not a lot of time, but like it's also not much time saving over just scanning with a pixelator that's $40, okay. which is way cheaper and it's an excellent uh -huh. product. And so, like, this is a very specific, like, you wouldn't scan cut film with a Paycon either. Um, oh, this is okay. better than a Paycon for that, but it's still not much better than a Pixelator at, like, a tenth the price, you know? So maybe this is going to change a few things with people who, um, you know, whether or not you store your film cut or whether you get, you know, like a roll of sleeve and you put that and then you start saving them in boxes or, so or I, something else. I still prefer to store things flat in sleeve. Mm -hmm. um, and that's not going to preclude me from the, scanning them in this thing. But like now I develop a roll, I scan the roll through the scanner and then I cut it and sleeve it. And like, if I ever go back, I never really want to scan a whole roll because I've done that. Like it's one or two images either for a higher resolution or oh, whatever. Good point preview scanner and I can use this if I have it right but if if all I'm doing is digitizing my grandpa's collection which are cut into fours I just buy a pixel here right like <laughs> it, it is a good product um and you know I'm here to push my product not Hamish's but like also Hamish did a damn good job took him yeah. you know, roughly three of my kickstarter lengths to put one out but Damn good. And I learned some lessons from There was no dig there. I want to point out there was no dig there. No, I, mean, <laughs> look, I, I really, I think, like, if you're scanning cut film, that is that is the product, like, yeah. hands down to use. Um, yeah. But, you know, it, it made me really think, even if I'm going to make 100 of these, like, 3D printing, I can make, like, this thing weighs a pound and a half. 750 kilos or kilos, uh, 750 grams is like not a, um, it's not a light duty thing, but I just wanted to make it really beefy and still make it 3D printable uh, because, you know, I didn't want to deal with the injection molding nightmares. Of other I don't know. 750 grams is an awful lot of grams. <laughs> 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 yeah, that's that's somebody that's somebody's fever dream. <laughs>
uh, Facts, Formulas, and Shortcuts, and it's by Ken Horner. Um, and it's extremely useful for all sorts of construction, not necessarily even woodwork, but when you just figuring out how things need to be put together. And then the other book I want to put up is kind of to take us in, in the opposite direction. So we've been busy solving a lot of technical problems, and I'm getting close to medium format uh, camera system that really appeals to me. And once I've got all the uh, the basics figured out, I'd like to get into making more beautiful cameras. And this book is a woodcarver's problem solver, and it's got you know tips, techniques, and shortcuts. It's bit it's basically put together like an encyclopedia, um, and it's by a guy with a very apt name of Graham R. Bull. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, you could say that I am full of bull, but this guy's got the name. Okay. And so it has, it has all sorts of sort of stuff that you kind of go through it and you immediately get ideas about how to do things, how to solve problems for carving. And carving is kind of, I think, an underused part of the work we do. Like you can make a box, but it, you can then make uh, shapes that are much friendlier to use and, you know, salt and not just decorative, but, you know, uh, uh, stuff that has to do with how, how you handle the the uh, equipment makes it more comfortable to use more uh, quicker more to appealing use. more yeah. appealing as i say as i say every time it's the camera that says pick me up that's the camera that you use um more often so when you right. when you have the ability to make decorations like i have um or decorative or beautiful cameras like i have an undo six by six mark two this is a beautiful camera it says use me um and uh and that's that that's kind of what um uh what we're talking about with that yeah and it's actually just the inverse of the 3d printing is is you know doing exact it's the opposite of ex subtraction but you get to the same place it, it's mm -hmm. um they're just different tools but in the end i noticed that when ethan has done 3d printing his cameras he does quite a bit of carving on them <laughs> so um uh nick and i are going to do a couple shout outs because i think ethan has some extra uh stuff so nick you want to do your shout outs well i i want to shout out in a kind of broad way to all the people who are working on uh new ways to make your own shutter this is something i'm excited about i'm just using uh focal plane shutters that are built into uh, speed graphics at this point, but it opens up this huge world of other lenses for homemade cameras. And meanwhile, out there, there are some other people. Um, so 20 cent cameras has, has come up with a really cool, uh, very large, ultra large format um, guillotine style shutter. And it's in the front, uh, in the front of a lens. Yeah, but it could be either side. And then Chroma mm -hmm. Camera is working with Dave Walker, I guess, to make some really uh, cool new shutters, again, that can handle very large lenses and give you reasonably fast shutter speeds. So there's a bunch of movement right now on several fronts and, that is very exciting. And there's one other project, and I just realized that I didn't put in my notes, so I don't have the name. But there's somebody out there making a two-curtain shutter with in a 3d box do you okay ethan who is that i don't know <laughs> okay a, i think it, Dave Walker sent it to me okay yeah yeah it's on instagram and it's somebody i follow on instagram and i apologize we will get your name in the show notes um and um and also uh we're going to be talking a lot about shutters in some future episodes and we will get that um uh We'll get that information at that point. And also a shout out to all the people who are participating in the shutter discussion in the uh, Homemade Camera Podcast Flickr group, which is not a lot of people, but we're, they're all diehards there. And we've been talking a lot about rotary shutters. And I was very excited to see that in cine photography, there are cameras for making you know film movies where they use a rotary shutter that has a reflective surface. So when the shutter's closed, it reflects into a reflex system so you can see through the lens for composition and even focusing. And the whole mechanism is so much more compact, in, or it could be in principle, than the typical mirror in a reflex camera. You have to tilt it. You have, it makes the camera a funny shape. But I think it's a really interesting, mm -hmm. different way to get through the lens 
viewing. And and then my final shout out is really just to our community. Um, over specifically over the last year, I mean, I guess maybe it's even um, after COVID kind of dropped in on us and we started spending more time at home. Um, the the solving of problems that have been barriers for a long time. Uh, there's a lot of lateral thinking. There's a lot of um, uh, just some amazing work. I mean, I can't tell you how much, how proud I am to be a member of the community um, that is stepping up and solving a bunch of issues uh, by lateral thinking and, and finding you know, old processes that we can, we can make new again. Um, everybody who's listening to this, you're, you're all a member of the community and I'm just proud as hell to be, uh, to, uh, name myself as part of that community. So, um, great work, absolutely great work out there. Ethan, do you want to, um, uh, talk so about your, I hate you guys. <laughs> what we stole all your, your shout outs. No, oh, yeah, no, I got a couple. Um, yeah. One, um, I, I just, you know, want to thank M and if you guys, I mean, by some really crazy chance are not already followers of emulsive.org, you should, um, M really gave me the push that I needed to get back into film photography and sort of has been, been like a, smart and reasonable cheerleader of mine that I, I really appreciate and um, you know, kind of made this latest project happen. Um, the other is Matt Beckberger, a competitor of mine who beat me to the punch and taught me an invaluable lesson. Um, we had Matt on the podcast when he uh, released the Reveni Labs uh, light meter, which was an idea that I had had for years. And it's uh, apparently like there's three or four Chinese companies making them now. Um, but Matt taught me the lesson that like there's there's enough people out there for like universal electronics that you can uh, get things FCC tested. And he taught me not to just sit and complain and to just like go do something. And I think had he not taught me that expensive lesson, uh, I would not be doing this. And so like one, his work is always like amazing and inspirational, but like that that painful lesson was uh, extremely good. So I got I got to thank him and uh, tell people to go check out RevenniLabs.com. We'll have the link in the show notes. Uh, Matt's making some really cool stuff, and he's coming out in the next zine in the last zine. Hey Graham, show that any light meter. Yep, that's my Reveni light meter I'll right hold there. It the camera. Oh yeah. Oh well, I did. Uh, here, I'll I'll hold it and then focus it maybe. Ooh, up there. Oh, and I turned my camera off okay the so my last, worst camera system uh, my last shout out is um if you are a follower of the podcast and have been listening for the last i don't know six or seven months uh we went through a spell there where all i could talk about with, was the bronco pan which was a camera that i started building um because my friend eric bronco was getting to shoot a movie uh, on film and he was going to burn a couple hundred thousand dollars worth of film and developing and he wanted a panoramic camera to shoot some film stills uh, along with uh, you know on the set and for location scouting or you know just just testing out film stocks and um, I had just gotten off the uh, the project uh, making the homunculus uh, which was inspired by Nick Lyle over there and I had that lens mount and I knew the lens would cover it anyway I built this whole uh, the Bronco Pan based upon uh, my friend Eric shooting this movie, which is coming out, I think, October 9th on Netflix. It's called The 40-Year-Old Version. Looks pretty funny. Don't know. I haven't seen it yet. But I've seen the trailer. It's out on YouTube, The 40-Year-Old Version, and it is beautiful. It's shot in black and white, I think, on Kodak X. And if you are a photographer, fan of uh, cinematic photography or, um, you know, like, beautiful black and white panoramas, which um, I am certainly into, at least check out the trailer, probably watch the movie. It's amazing. Eric has worked on two films in the last two and a half years that have both won Sundance. And so, uh, yeah, go check it out. The 40 year old version. Super cool. Graham, you're muted.
Graham, you're muted. Okay, there we go. Uh, I was asking, should we? Do we have any more um, uh, shout outs or anything? Uh, anything anybody wants to mention, or should we thank Robbie? Robbie Cribs, that's a shout out we need to do. Yeah, let's do that. Okay, uh, Robbie, thank you very much for um, composing the music and allowing us to use it each week. Uh, visit Robbie Cribs at soundtrapstudios.com. And Nick, you had something to say? Thanks, Robbie. Thanks, Robbie. Thanks, Robbie. Thanks, Robbie.